which we have created this beautiful campaign of indie proud and this is something that uh, you know was hugely liked and and people have responded very well we have been able to encourage more than 407 adoptions of indian breeds uh, as part of this campaign it is a small effort but it gives us a lot of satisfaction that uh, you know people are warming up to such efforts so with this i would uh, uh, just ask for a video on indie indie proud to be played thank you so much mama bol di thi no streets in this house because she was scared of them but when papa bought toto from the shelter his love changed her i always wanted a pet so when a kid proved abroad he said let's get one but the real challenge was kahan se my friend suggested a shelter and there we fell in love with our indies i read a post about rescued stray looking for a loving home but people were commenting none of them wanted a stray as pet and i felt bad so i went to that shelter and adopted this cute little indie toto's affection changed mama's fear into love we are proud to adopt the indies from a shelter love is no breed jab aap ek indie ko adopt karte ho usse nayi life milti hai be indie proud adopt now स्टोरीज and i'm sure all of you would be really interested to uh, read it uh, i would also again reiterate what nitin said this indie proud campaign was something which was really welcomed we tied up with about 45 ngos and we continue to do indie adoptions so people we know that people in india are keen but if we can create the right ecosystem for people to come and adopt you know build those uh, facilities and all that i am sure that we will be able to get there so thank you nitin I would now like to invite our guest of honor, Dr. Chini Krishna, founder of Blue Cross of India, to uh, to speak to this August gathering. Dr. Krishna. Dr Krishna you have to unmute yeah sorry thank you very much uh, since the seminar is being held at kolkata i'd like to just mention a fact that most of you may not be aware of in 1966 following the proposed animal birth control program of the blue cross of india rukmini devi arundel who was the chairman of the animal welfare board of india had visited calcutta and bombay and signed memorandums of understanding with both the municipalities there to do an animal birth control program in the two cities unfortunately the uh, mou because rukmini devi felt that the surgeons were not geared up to do the uh, lapros the, the operations of the females the ovarian hysterectomy she insisted that the abc program be restricted to the male dogs only and uh, th that was one of the reasons why the the program was not successful and both bombay and calcutta discontinued the program after 2 years but in any case the animal birth control program has been adopted by all the major organizations in the world the who the oie and the fao and the biggest compliment that they pay the blue cross is that they do not call it the tnr or the cnr program at all they call all of them now refer to it as the abc or the animal birth control program we called it the abc program to convince the municipalities that the control of the street dog population was as simple as abc and it is true with very little effort if a sustained aggressive animal birth control program can be carried out there is absolutely no doubt 
that the number of dogs on the street can be brought down dramatically. It has been proved physically in Jaipur, Kalimpong, and in Chennai till about 2012, at which point the city municipal boundaries were increased by a very, very large factor and brought in new areas which were not controlled by the ABC program. However, between 2000, 1996, when we started the ABC program on a large scale, and 2000. Okay, confirmed human deaths in 1996 was brought down to zero. In 2010, the Corporation of Chennai declared Chennai to be rabies free because there had been no human deaths from rabies for three successive years. Unfortunately, after that, there have been a couple of deaths, but the number of deaths in Madras has been very, very low. The fact remains that even one death due to rabies is one death too many because rabies is a totally preventable disease. Uh, Mr. Jain had mentioned about ending pet homelessness. I'll make it very clear. As far as my personal stand is concerned, a street is really no place for a dog. Every dog deserves a loving family and a loving home. But as long as they are there on the street, it is our duty to make sure that they are treated in the most humane way possible and the reduction of animals on the street is done in the most humane way possible which is very very doable as far as the ABC program is concerned. The Chennai Corporation, Chennai is one of the hundred smart cities. I mean uh, it may not be very obvious to many people who look at Chennai but Chennai is one of the smart cities. The managing director of the smart city program is Raj Charubal has recently unveiled a program called CCAP, which is Chennai Care for Animals Project. And I'm sure that with the help of Mr. Cherubal and the spreading of the CCAP to other smart cities, we would see a dramatic change in the attitude of human beings towards the, the dogs on the street. I have, I would like, I have only five minutes allotted to me and I, I would like to stop at this point. At the uh, discussion stage, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Krishna. We totally agree with you that a street is no place for uh, dogs or cats. And uh, it's. I hope that this endeavor that we are trying to do and all of us together can change whatever we can possibly change. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you for being with us. I would now like to invite our guest of honor, Dr. Chanchal Guha, Vice Chancellor, WBUAFS, to say a few words. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning to the delegates uh, sitting on the dais and these of the dais. Now this is a golden opportunity for me as because being the uh, this uh, institute uh, this institution as the university of this West Bengal University of Animal and Fisheries Sciences. I'm really very very thankful to this organization, particularly this uh, uh, this Mars Pit gear, as because uh, these we are the personals taking the pivot role in relation to this care management and the control of these pets. And there are different programs that are being organized by the different NGOs, different official organizations, different government organizations. organizations. But this type of this attitude or this type of this venture and this program is very, very useful and helpful for the society. But at the same time, this will not only improve this development at the same time it will help to develop the awareness of the people who are having the pets but if we consider about this total population who are they are reared in the universe or this world most of them are rare, this uh, rather being neglected and they are mostly the stray pets 
and they are neither getting this proper nutrition nor this management good this uh, source of this uh, residence and they are not getting the good habitat so if this type of this uh, attempt or if this type of program is being organized very regularly and the different aims not only the cities but also in the rural areas so that people can aware how this can be developed so that's why so we are academically we are uh, discussing different aspects nutrition healthcare management and other things but the actual thing what is the main this uh, important role behind this the stray pets is not being cared i tell you the different programs have been organized by these different organizations like this uh, this uh, uh, association of uh, prevention and control of this rabies different abc program so this program are officially there but i am really associated with these programs and our this university is also going for this regular abc program in different occasions in the year but this is not at the optimum level which can nicely control this birth of this pet because you know this pet population is increasing in such a way that if we cannot control the pets then we cannot control the disease the the, the disease what is causing 100% case fatality or the 100% mortality that is the rabies so these programs are being organized in a very planned way so that not only we can control the disease but at the same time we can control the population which is very very important in relation to the development of this pet population at the same time the attitude of the people who can rear very nicely of these pets now the different aspects if we go for this academic purposes like this uh, uh, this uh, end pet homeless uh, index or the different parameters but which is literally possible literally being assessed but it is very very difficult to implement in the field level that's why it needs the knowledge attitude and the practice but this is really as a veterinarian i feel this we people are very much lacking so this three three components that is this knowledge attitude and the practice is very very important in relation to care the pets properly so that we can make the world very healthy very this wealthy at the same time is a good habitat for the pets this is all and there are a lot of things are to be discussed but this is not the platform to discuss all these things but only thing is that we can only improve the awareness of the people those who are having the pets those who are taking care of the pets in the stray animal or particularly in the stray pets and at the same time they have to develop the attitude then only we can make the world very healthy in relation to the rearing of the pets thank you thank you very much namaskar thank you sir that was really well said definitely knowledge attitude and practices are very important and i think that's where knowledge sharing and change of behavior and attitude is very critical for all stakeholders and society in general so i think that's very important thank you so much sir uh, i would now like to invite our guest of honor dr nitasha dogar fad5 member secretary and scientist dbis to join us online uh, ms dogar over to you thank you bharani i hope that i am audible yes you're audible thank you a very good morning to all of you it gives me great pleasure to be associated with this seminar to create a better world for companion animals which brings together a wide range of uh, stakeholders participants on a common platform the government ngos academic institutes and corporates to share their knowledge and views for a common cause we all love the warmth and attention our companion animals give us it's an absolute blessing to have a pet having a pet comes with the responsibility of pet care pet health and well being is a subset of animal welfare which is a very complex and multifaceted subject animal welfare encompasses all the elements of nutrition health environment behavior and mental state it is a subject with growing interest from the civil society and it is one of the priorities of world organization for animal health also animal welfare is also important because there are so many animals around the world suffering from being used for entertainment food medicine fashion 
scientific development and advancements and it is uh, exotic pets also so in this context bis the national standards body of india is playing its part by formulating indian standards on animal feeds animal husbandry and equipment through its technical committees bis technical committee structure bring, brings together all uh, relevant stakeholders industry consumers regulators r and d institutes and then develop standards keeping in view national interest and taking into account view of all the stakeholders through a process of consultation animal feeds and nutritional sectional committee fad5 is a very important uh, technical committee of bis which is involved in the formulation of indian standard in the field of animal feeds and nutrition under this uh, committee there are various indian standards which have been formulated uh, on animal feeding stuffs mineral mixtures compounded feeds and feed sub supplements another important uh, committee which is uh, relevant to today's uh, topic is uh, animal husbandry and equipment sectional committee which is which is fad32 which is responsible for formulation of indian standard for management practices welfare transport of livestock poultry pet and uh, laboratory animals indian standard uh, is 11968 many of you uh, might be aware of this indian standard but this is a very important indian standard formulated by bis which is for pet food for dogs and cats your pet may love to eat food uh, fresh from your plate but just because they like it doesn't mean it is good for them keeping the specific nutritional needs of pet into consideration bis has formulated this indian standard this uh, standard not only specify distinct nutri nutritional requirements for cats and dogs but also for kittens and puppies if you are feeding your pet uh, with the food as per this indian standard is 11968 there is no need to give complementary feed supplements like additives vitamins minerals as your pet food is complete diet in itself so it is very important to get this indian standard implemented and the industry should use this indian standard implementation of this indian standard by the pet food industry will not only ensure adequate balanced diets free of toxins and contaminants to the pet but will also enhance market competitiveness to achieve quality and uh, reduce cost of manufacturing by eliminating rejections dogs and cats are not only reared as domestic pets but uh, considered useful animals for many other purposes so such as guide dogs for uh, uh, police and military services also they also subjected to scientific and biological tests as laboratory animals so in view of reliance of these animals and their diverse roles they are frequently transported to safeguard the health and welfare of dogs and cats during their transportation BIS has formulated another important standard that is IS four seven four six, which prescribes essential requirements for the transport of dogs and cats by rail, road, and air. So this standard covers uh, various requirements, which also includes requirements for the size of the container for transporting uh, dog and cats, and also the labeling of the container. standards for animal health and well being are absolutely essential uh, they are vital to the industry and are crucial to animal health and safety standards are formulated taking into account contribution of science technology and experience and are aimed at uh, promotion of optimum community benefits while standards supports in uh, as well standards support in ensuring quality and safety of all types of products and services it is i would like to highlight that it is the industry which is working as a veritable backbone in the standard development process it is their participation uh, their feedback their competitiveness to perform and their desire to apply standards that is taking us to the desired destination where we can pass every benchmark of quality they continued um, an enhanced involvement in standardization at national as well as international level is very important to ensure harmonious uh, standardization activities in the country we all know that the influence about the influence of standards uh, that they have on global trade also it is well known to the industry particularly those who are involved in export of their products for example um, in india to have influence uh, if you want the india to have that influence in the global trade it is very important that we adopt the best practices the best global practices so that to have a penchant of perfection and quality 
I think that standards and their co compliances are the only means of achieving this. So with these words, I again compliment Mass Pet Care India for organizing this event and uh, thank, th thank them to, for providing me this opportunity to uh, just this August gathering. I wish this event all the very success. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dogar. That was really well said. I think it's really like you said, you know, human food is not suitable for pets and therefore standards are crucial to the health of pets. And ma'am, we assure you that the industry is very, very keen. And I think this entire stakeholder group here present is also very keen to work with and partner with BIS to ensure that we have the best standards available. And then eventually everybody starts following those standards. In, uh, in fact, with the kind of growth that we see in the industry, pet food standards becomes really critical and important. So thank you so much for your time and please request you to stay on as you're part of our panel as well. So thank you. I would now uh, request our guest of honor, Dr. Tabapriya Mazumdar, Executive Health Officer, Kolkata Municipal Corporation, to share his views on the subject. Sir. Hello, everybody. I've come from Kolkata Municipal Corporation Health Department. Actually, I was not supposed to come. The original invitation was to our municipal commissioner. He couldn't make time for this. He requested our CMHO, Chief Municipal Health Officer, and he requested me to come. First, I should say that uh, we have a veterinary officers, lots of veterinary officers in our department, health department, and the activities they are performing, this much I can say on their behalf. <clears throat> Basically, I'm not a veterinary expert, so in this line, I'm not very much well knowledge. Uh, I'm basically a ENT specialist, but my job is public health here. First, I should say that the exact department we name Dealing with dogs is public safety. Public safety, that is the department. And what is there and what is the activities of this department? First, if there is a complaint from any locality that there is a disturbing dog in the locality biting people, what we do is that our team, dog squad, goes and picks up the dog, brings the dog to a dog pound, sterilizes it, especially I think of male dogs, and then relocates them in the same locality from th where the dog has been picked up. For this, we have to face the wrath of the locality people because they want the dogs to be completely removed from there. But that is not our process. We have to relocate the dog in the same, provide that the dog is not rabbit. If the dog is rabbit, then what we do? We run two dog pounds in Kolkata. The bigger one is in Dhapa, which can, uh, which provide, uh, we can accommodate uh, 273 dogs, mind it, 273 dogs, as the sprawling compound is there. And another small one we have at Entali in Kolkata, and that is only for 33 dogs. Out of the 273 kennels we they have there, 10 are isolated for these infectious misrabid dogs. And what are the activities we do there? Number one is that ABC, somebody has discussed just now, um, animal birth control. That is one of the activities. Then we have the trauma care. If three dogs faces meets an accident, we pick up the dogs, we treat it there. And once it is cured and can move around all by itself, we again relocate the dog in the same locality from where we have picked up. And infectious disease, I have said that there's an isolation ward that can house 10 dogs. Hmm. And if you know the fate of the rabbit dogs. So we take care and isolate them till their fate. And then we have the anti rabies vaccination. Just now, in the whole city of Calcutta, we have 
144 watts. In each watt, twice a week, we are having a program of sterilization of male dogs and anti rabies vaccination. It will be going on for the coming three months and till we cover the whole city of Kolkata. This is what we are doing. For this, we have done a lot of IEC, lot of publicity, and our dog squad has collected nearly all the dogs from the each locality from where, uh, where the program will be held. And there we have carried out our camps like this with the, of course, with the help of the local councillor or chairman, whoever is there. This is how we are going on. Well, one thing uh, to end my lecture, one thing I would like to say, I have learned a new word from this, which I have <laughs> going to take home, and that is Indies. And sorry, I never heard the name before. And who has given this nomenclature? I'm not sure about it. Dr. Chavin can say who has given this nomenclature. <laughs> Yourself, <laughs> right. or marketing team. Fine, because we used to call the these uh, stray dogs or street dogs very bad names, you know, Lady Kutta and all these things, very insulting and very cruel, I think. I have been, I'm a dog lover. I had dogs, but unfortunately, I'm very ashamed to say none of them were stray dogs or Indies. Both were high degree GSD. So I'm sorry. Next time when I keep a dog, I'll keep Dr. Chan's advice in mind. <laughs> Fine. This is all. And... Uh, this is how we are carrying out in the activities in the Kolkata Municipal Corporation. And people depend on us. We are helping the society. We are doing public safety. And that's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Majumdar. I think uh, the Municipal Corporations are all doing a great work in terms of uh, uh, really looking after public health. And I think one of the topics that we will be discussing subsequently uh, in the health and welfare, better cities for pets, is going to be about one, one health, where animal uh, ecological as well as uh, human health is interconnected. And I think that's where all these efforts come into play. So thank you so much, Dr. Majumdar, for being with us today. I would now like to invite our chief guest, uh, Mr. Kingshuk Pramanik, who is the chairman of the State Animal Welfare Board, uh, Kolkata, uh, to uh, share his views uh, with all of us. Good morning, all. Dr. Mojundar, Dr. Guho, Mr. Join, ladies and gentlemen. Human beings are the supreme creation of the Almighty. Any person is called human for its human. In this era of existential crisis, every living being is in utter dilemma of existence. They try to survive maintaining their balance, but they state, but the state dogs and pets are very vulnerable because they have no judiciary to have justice. So their justice is always denied in this hegemony of the brutal and cruelty. Cruelty over animal is being rampant. The news seldom makes headlines in the newspaper, social media, television channel. I'm not blaming the non-implementation of Wildlife Protection Act 1972, rather, we are feeling a deficiency of human outlooks towards this vulnerable creature. Our today discussion is on this matter of serious concern. Our motto is not to do the pain paperwork. Rather, we have to swing into action. In this matter, 
concerned societies, participation is necessary. Our government, West Bengal government, under the dynamic leadership of Ms. Mamuta Banerjee, is very sympathetic and concerned about the matter. We as the part of the government is also trying to keep an eye over any misdoing with the state pets. The NGOs and various stakeholders are working with as a team in our state. I especially thank to Mars Protection, Mars, Mars, Mars Space Care for inviting me as a chief guest. I propose to take a place from this stage to fight for well-being of the pets collectively with utmost seriousness. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Pramanik. I think what you said was absolutely perfect that we have to swing into action. Social participation is important and really animals have no judiciary to give them justice. So really well said. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us. I would now uh, like to invite my colleague, uh, Mr. Mantesh uh, Shirani, our regional sales manager handling the East region to uh, convey the vote of thanks. Uh, Mantesh has been working for Mars since 2013 in the sales function, handling different sales roles. He has overall sales experience of more than 20 years in FMCG sector. Ma Mantesh is also a passionate pet lover and a pet parent of a golden retriever called Fluffy. Mantesh, show it. Thank you, Osida. Uh, first of all, a graceful and warm thanks for the, all the chief guests and uh, guest of honor as well as the panelists and the uh, members for attending this. Uh, and on behalf of uh, Mass Pet Care and, uh, and entire fraternity, I would uh, thank all the uh, uh, members here, uh, especially the chief guest, uh, Dr. Uh, King Shung Pramanik and the guest of honors, uh, Dr. Tapa Priya Majumdar, Dr. Chanchal Guha and Dr. S. Chinna, Chini Krishna, uh, along with Ms. Natasha Dogra and uh, Ms. Cecilia Villaverde for taking their time out and uh, spend, uh, giving us opportunity uh, to give their opinion as well as uh, views in terms of how can we take it forward and uh, make this occasion a graceful one. Uh, I also thank uh, our internal team, corporate affairs team for uh, uh, led by Vasuda, Abhijit and Bernie for uh, putting their efforts in anchoring this thought leadership uh, seminar and uh, making it, taking it to Kolkata. And uh, I once again thank all the members and panelists and uh, uh, thanks, a big thanks from uh, Mass Pet Care. Thank you. Thank you, Mantesh. Uh, now we would have uh, our guest of honor, uh, Dr. Cecilia Vilaverde. She is the co-chair of Vasawa Global Pet Nutrition Committee, and she is going to be doing a keynote for us on pet nutrition. Uh, I would really like to thank you, Dr. Villaverde, to, for making time for us in a holiday, in between your holiday and really, really early morning in Ireland. So thank you for being with us. Uh, just to introduce Dr. Villaverde, uh, BVSC PhD Diplomate Nutrition of the ACVIM Board Certified Veterinary Nutrition. Du diplomate ECVCN EBVS European vet specialist in veterinary and comparative nutrition. Uh, Dr. Vela Verde obtained her veterinary degree in 2000 and her PhD in animal nutrition in 2005 by the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, Spain. She worked as a postdoctoral researcher in feline nutrition at University of California, Davis, where she also completed a residency in small animal clinic nutrition at the Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital. She is both certified in veterinary nutrition by the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine Nutrition and by the European College of Veterinary and Comparative Nutrition since 2010. She's currently the past president of ECVCN and after working as a chief of service in the Veterinary Teaching Hospital Nutrition Service in Barcelona for six years, she is now a consultant in cl clinical nutrition Nutrition for Expert Pet Nutrition and Veterinary Information Network. 
She's also the co-chair of the Vasawa Global Nutrition Committee and has written several articles and book chapters on the topic of companion animal nutrition. I think it's a topic that we really need to talk about right now. So over to you, uh, Dr. Vila Bharti. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I hope you all can see me and I did prepare some slides. Let me know if, if you cannot see them. We can see um, this. Thank you. Well, first of all, I, I would like um, to thank Mars for the invitation to speak with you today. And I got assigned the topic of the importance of veterinary nutrition education and global standards. Uh, it is a big topic, so I tried to basically build, <laughs> boil it down to, to the most important points so as not to take uh, so much of your time. Um, but I think what I want to transmit here is the very important relationship between nutrition and health uh, in the pet population, uh, dogs and cats mostly is what I work with. And this relationship, I see it in two ways, right? One of them is what we call your nutritional pathology, meaning, and some of the other guests have already talked a little bit about this, how having an inadequate diet can cause disease. Uh, and this can be due to nutritional factors like a nutrient deficiency or nutrient toxicity, but also to issues of safety like microbiological contamination or mycotoxin or other uh, contaminants that could be in the food. Um, so diet or nutrition can be cause of disease. Uh, on the other hand, diet can help manage diseases. And these are what we call these nutrient sensitive diseases that, uh, for example, kidney disease, that the diet is not the problem, but the solution, right? And we can use it to diagnose and to manage diseases. So for both healthy pets on a preventative medicine kind of way, and also for pets with disease in a clinical kind of way, it is very important that we always consider nutrition um, as a potential cause of the problem, but also as a potential solution. So I have some examples of nutritional pathology and probably the most common that we see are deficiencies. And I would say it depends a lot on where you see it. Uh, one of the diseases that we can see with an inadequate diet are skeletal diseases like rickets. Uh, or nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism. Those are vitamin D and or calcium deficiencies. This is very typical of pets that are only fed meat, right? Because meat is very rich in phosphorus, but is very poor in calcium. And depending on the meat, also very poor in vitamin D. So we can see basically um, a, a lack of strength in the bones and that can lead to fractures and, you know, a lot of problems. This is a disease in Europe that is very rarely seen anymore because uh, it was mostly associated to unbalanced homemade diets that we were just giving our pets our leftovers. Uh, this is much less common now with commercial pet food. Other diseases that you can see with deficiencies are skin diseases, um, for example, associated to deficiency of essential fatty acids or minerals like zinc or vitamins like vitamin A. Uh, again, uh, at least in Europe, this is not something that you see that often, but you can see this um, in, in, in animals that have been, are being fed a diet that doesn't have all the nutrients that they need. Um, and in several areas of the world, is definitely still common. Uh, one of the common deficiencies that we could see in cats is a taurine deficiency. Taurine is an amino acid, um, and in cats it can cause heart disease, but also eye disease. It can cause blindness. Um, and again, this is, was a disease that we started to see, and then it was associated to taurine, and then a taurine requirement was defined in the standard. So this is now uh, in America and in Europe, it's very uncommon to see if they're being fed a good commercial diet, potentially possible if they're feeding a homemade diet or especially if cats are fed mostly plant or vegetarian based diets. So this is just an example of some of the deficiencies that we can see. These are not the only ones, but just to show you the importance of a complete diet or prom providing all the nutrients to make sure that the pet, the dog or the cat maintains their health. Um, 
Um, we can have also nutritional pathology related to excess. For example, vitamin D toxicity, which has happened in some commercial products uh, due to mistakes in the formulation, can cause kidney problems. Energy excess, for sure, it's a problem that can result in overweight or obesity, especially if the energy that the pets get is higher than the ones that they expend. Um, and then we also have, for example, joint problems in large breed puppies that can be associated to excess. It can be excess energy. Some of these breeds, like the one in this picture, but also Great Danes or German Shepherd Dogs, if they grow too fast uh, during their puppyhood, they can have an imbalance between the growth of the muscle and the growth of the skeleton, and that can cause uh, problems like hip dysplasia or others. Uh, a diet that's also very high in calcium can also alter the bone formation of these animals, and they can also have bone malformations. So this would be examples on the importance of, yes, you need to provide all the nutrients that they need in a minimum value, but you never have to go over their excess. And for that, again, it's very important that we have well-defined standards of where the nutrients should be. So really, uh, very simply stated, when we want to prevent these problems of deficiencies or excesses, we want to focus on what we call the complete and balanced diet. And what does that mean? Right. Uh, what does complete mean? Complete means it has all the nutrients that they need. Like I'm not going to go into detail here, but basically animals need macronutrients and micronutrients, including protein, fat, carbohydrates, vitamins and minerals. And when we add all of this up, they require about 40 essential nutrients in their diet. So all of those nutrients need to be there for the diet to be complete but they have to be in the right amount. If we give too little, we may get deficiency. If we get too much, you may get toxicity. So you have a range of adequate concentration for the nutrient, and this is for each one of them, right? And uh, at least 40. So you can see why there's so many diets in the market. There's multiple ways to make a diet complete and balanced, as long as all those nutrients are there um, in the right zone. So who defines what complete and balanced means? We do have a lot of scientific information and a lot of um, countries or regions will incorporate that into nutritional standards. I can speak of Europe, which is where I work mostly, um, but the nutritional standards that we have are defined by FDF, which is the Euro European fed pet food industry, and those have been endorsed by the EU government. Um, and it's very helpful because it has this, this is an example, <laughs> you can probably cannot see it that well, but you can download their standards from the FDF website and it tells you, you know, you have the nutrient and then you have the amounts, depending if you're a dog or a cat, a puppy or an adult or a kitten or an adult or a reproducing female. And then it will give you your minimum and it will give you your maximums. So this is very helpful for manufacturers of pet food to ensure that their product meets the requirements. Also very helpful for me as a clinician to know that I can trust uh, that the diet is meeting what I need it to meet for, for the dog or the cat to be healthy. Uh, for example, in the United States, their standards are uh, AFCO, set by AFCO. And um, as I was hearing from you guys, uh, India is also developing their own nutritional standards, which is great news. Just uh, to finish up a little bit on the second aspect, remember uh, we were talking about diet as a cause of disease. And to solve that, we want the diet to be complete and balanced. And for that, nutritional standards are very helpful. On the other way, we have these diseases that can respond to dietary management. These are just some examples of those diseases or metabolic disturbances that we can sort of help. For example, diabetes mellitus. And in order to manage these patients, we use what we call the veterinary diet. Um, we can use them for diagnostics, for example, of food allergy or for the treatment, both for the short term, for example, in animals that are in the hospital, or for the long term, like a kidney disease, etc. So they're very useful tools for veterinarians, um, you know, together with medication, surgery, and other treatments to uh, make the best for our patients. In the European Union, 
veterinary diets are regulated through what we call the PARNUT um, legislation. And PARNUT is this pet food with a particular nutritional purpose. So basically, it defines what that diet should look like. So if this is a diet for you know, um, a hospitalized animal, it has to have a lot of calories, high in protein, all of those things. So those are some nutritional standards based on science. Um, and the diet that is marketed for that disease has to meet those requirements. Again, this is very helpful for veterinarians that are taking care of sick animals, because this is a basic guarantee that these diets will follow the scientific evidence for what we want to do with them. Um, Diets that fall under the PARNOT registration have to be used under veterinary guidance. So as veterinarians and everyone in our veterinary team needs to be familiar with them in order to use them properly and help our pets. This is uh, an example of what the PARNOT looks like. For, for example, in this case, it would be for renal disease or kidney disease, then it defines what it needs to happen. The phosphorus has to be this level, the protein has to be this level. And then it tells you what it should say on the label and how long can you use this, etc. So for this, we have that for a variety of diseases. And you know, if there is no PARNAT, then the diet cannot make such a claim. So everybody has to apply for a new PARNET. And this protects the public for, you know, non-scientific claims. So veterinary professionals are key in for both aspects, both to pre prevent nutritional pathology in healthy animals, but also to treat patients that actually have disease. Um, and veterinarians are very important for this because we are the ones deciding what we are going to feed this pet. Uh, and for that, you need to do your nutritional assessment, you assess the animal, you assess the food, the feeding method. And then what we say is develop a feeding plan. What do I feed? How much do I feed? And how do I feed it? And the veterinary team needs to collect all that information, right? So in, in deciding what to feed, what is the best diet or the best food for this dog or cat, you want it to be complete and balanced for the species and for the life stage, but you also want it to be adequate. There's not one single diet that's best for everyone, and most pets can do well with a variety of diets. So it's very important that the veterinary team assesses, you know, not only the species and the life stage, but also activity level. Is it an aging pet? Um, what is the health status? Is there any sensitivities, any metabolic disturbances? What are the preferences of the dog or cat? What is the budget of, of the pet owner? Uh, all of those things, uh, the veterinary team is best situated to assess and then choosing the right product. And you want to choose a product that has guarantees. You want to choose a product that you know you can trust and having nutritional standards definitely makes this much easier for everyone. Um, I guess my key point is that uh, adequate nutrition is essential for the health of pets. Um, and when we have nutritional standards for health, like what should a healthy dog or a healthy cat get when they're growing, when they're adults, when they're reproducing, uh, it gives us one way, you know, one part of the guarantee that the food that we're choosing is going to meet the nutritional needs of the pet. Uh, so they won't have any deficiencies or any excesses which can shorten their lifespan or affect their quality of life. It's also very important to have nutritional standards for disease and metabolic alterations, for example, like the PARNUTs that we have in Europe. Uh, so if we're going to use diet as part of the treatment of a disease, um, we can guarantee that we're doing something that is science-based, that it's for the best of the animal. It's going to, again, improve their survival and their quality of life. In order for that to, to happen, so standards are very important, but we are the ones applying the standards. So the veterinary professionals, we are going to be recommending preventative medicine now. We're going to be recommending vaccination, deworming. We're also be going to be recommending pet foods. Um, and then when we have a sick animal, we are going to do all these clinical measures, including diet. So we need to be very knowledgeable. Veterinary professionals must know what are the nutritional requirements of dogs and cats in health and disease. How can we do this nutritional assessment and then choose 
source the best food, you know, so we can make a better world for pets, <laughs> as, as Mars always says. Um, in order to do so, we need uh, veterinary nutrition education to be present in vet schools, um, part of the curriculum, both basic nutrition requirements and clinical nutrition. And this is what's going to help us as a profession to contribute to the health and wellness of dogs and cats. And with that, I would like to thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dr. Cecilia. That was uh, really uh, very, very comprehensive. And uh, yes, I do. Uh, I mean, what you said about the fact that nutrition is key to good health of pets, anything in excess or anything less is can can cause imbalances. Uh, also, it is very important, and uh, this is an appeal to Dr. Chanchal Guha here, is that nutrition as a subject should definitely be included in, uh, vet in the veterinary curriculum because it's key to animal health. And I would now uh, request my... Uh, uh, Dr. Cecilia, we'll just have a few Q questions and answers with you. And I will request my uh, colleague Akanksha to take this on. Uh, just a quick introduction to Akanksha Singh. She's a scientific and regulatory affairs lead for Mars Pet Care India. Before joining Mars, Akanksha was with the nutraceutical sector, where she has worked on policy change and regulation in India. She has a PhD in medicinal chemistry from CDRI and having postdoctoral research experience from IIT Mumbai. Uh, once we finish the Q&A with Dr. Cecilia, we'll start with the panel discussions. So over to you, uh, Akanksha. Thank you, Vasudha. Thank you, Dr. Cecilia, for sharing your thoughts on the importance of having adequate nutrition and also sharing with us some of the European nutritional guidelines. Thank you so much. And thank you all our guests and esteemed panelists. A very warm welcome to all of you. Today, I have been given the privilege of discussing your views. Yes, yes, I'm just, thank you for inviting. So uh, today, I've been given the privilege of discussing your views on the topic health and welfare of cats and dogs. And we will be discussing the importance of animal nutrition, pet food standards, healthcare facilities, and how vital the One Health approach is while we talk about the health and welfare of cats and dogs. And uh, before we start the question and answer round with Dr. Cecilia, let me give a quick round of introduction for all our pa panelists. So with Dr. Cecilia, we have our esteemed panelist with whom we are going to spend next one hour. And we have Ms. Natasha Doga. We have already heard her. Dr. Tapapriya Majumdar, sir. And we also have Dr. Satrupa Sanya. She is a Bengali independent parallel cinema film director, producer, actress, poet, as well as social and animal activist based in Kolkata. She is joining us online. And we have with us Ms. Sushmita Lahiri, who is founder and secretary, Voice for Animals Kolkata. Dr. Utpal Tatu, who is professor at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He is also an advisor to the Feline Club of India, Bangalore. And he has also served as a member of United States Pharmacopoeia Expert Panel for Biologics. He has done extensive research on infectious diseases. In fact, his lab has had developed RT-PCR kits for the detection of COVID-19. Dr. Madhumita Mukherjee, she is retired assistant director of fisheries government west bengal she worked as executive director at national fisheries development board dr shada radhakrishnan from chaya ngo she is actively involved in animal rescue and rehab dr aparajita chakrabarti she is a veterinary doctor and runs multiple vet clinics she is also a passionate animal lover based in kolkata and dr shubir bhattacharya a renowned veterinary doctor and owner of Paws and Claws Clinic in Kolkata. So before we seek our panel's view, I request our esteemed panelists to ask any questions they might have to Dr. Cecilia. Sure, ma'am, please go ahead. Hello, good morning. To clarify, I'm not a doctor. I just run this animal hospital for street animals. 
especially dogs, cows, horses. Now, my question to uh, Madam Dev is, see, when we take care of hundreds and hundreds of street animals in a shelter, both, you know, neutering, taking care of injuries and uh, looking after them. You see, it's very difficult to get a nutritional analysis done. How does one do that for so many? And we, it's a NGO, non-government organization struggling for funds every day. So on what basis do I identify whether an animal require is, you know, deficient in any particular vitamin or, you know, any major yeah. dietary requirement? How do I even look at it? I cannot afford to do a um, nutritional analysis or even a blood analysis. Yeah, that is a very good question. And there's a lot of things you can do that don't cost money. And actually, nutritional analyses are really not that good either. So I cannot really know the nutritional status of an animal just by a blood test uh, because blood doesn't really reflect the whole body. So I focus a lot on mainly two things. Uh, on the physical exam would be your body weight and your body condition score. That will give you an idea of the energy status of the animal. If it's very thin, they need more calories. If it's overweight, they need fewer calories. And their body weight is going to be your monitoring tool. And this is something that, you know, you need to get a scale. That would be the main investment. Um, and for the other part, just to, since we cannot really know the nutritional status of an animal, what I focus on is choosing a diet that it's complete. Right. Um, so just making sure that we choose a product that it's, you know, from a good manufacturer that follows the standards. You know, if the animal was malnourished before, we're going to fix it now. It doesn't really matter the nutritional status at this point. You just be very careful when you, especially if you suspect the animal has been starved or not eating a lot. Just very careful introduction of a complete diet very slowly. Uh, but just focus on how's the weight doing, how's the body condition score, choosing, you know, it doesn't have to be an expensive diet as long as it's just complete. Um, and that should be probably something that we can all do without having to spend a lot of money, <laughs> uh, which is a great point. Just a supplement to the same question. Yeah, I would like to ask, how good are plant proteins for dogs? You know, getting protein from soya, uh, is it always necessary to give them proteins only from meat sources? Another great question. Um, the, the answer is both animal and plant protein can be used for dogs. Plant protein alone can be a bit more difficult because of the amino acid profile is not as, as suited to the dog. So most diets actually have a mixture of plant-based and animal-based. Uh, it is definitely possible to do a complete plant-based diet for dogs. Um, it just You just need to choose one from a good manufacturer. Uh, but as long as it's properly processed, as long as the person who's formulating the diet knows the material and knows, you know, because for protein, we need it for three things, energy, nitrogen, amino acid. So uh, as long as the formulator takes that into account and it's from a digestible uh, source with, you know, uh, something that the animal can, can, can use, we can have plant-based diet for dogs or a combination, which is the most common. Um, it's just easier uh, when you have animal-based proteins because the amino acid profile is a bit more aligned to what the dog needs. But it's definitely possible. Just make sure you choose such a product from a good company that, that you trust. Great questions, Dr. Radhakrishnan. Yeah, yeah great questions. Uh, wonderful, Dr. Cecilia. Thanks for that wonderful talk. Really enjoyed it. And uh, wonderful also to know about your association with UC Davis. Uh, I am a visiting person at uh, you know UC Davis and a lot of interactions with BGL. But anyway, that aside, uh, uh, so much that I can catch up with you, but sort of a futuristic question, Dr. Cecilia. Would you have any comments on breed-specific nutrition? Are we actually <laughs> beginning to understand, you know, association of specific breeds and specificity of 
uh, no nutritional requirement. I know it's a very broad question, but if you have quick thoughts, I'll, I'll then follow up with you in future. Thank you so much. Okay, <laughs> thank you. It is a great question. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of choosing a diet for a patient, especially if you have the time. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's not the same situation with our previous person was talking about handling a large volume of animals. Um, some breeds are definitely prone to certain issues that can sort of be prevented by diet. At this point, I don't know that, you know, breed is just one thing, right? There are other things that are also affecting your nutritional status or your nutritional risks. Um, so I don't know if we're going to move through a more, you know, customized nutrition, not necessarily only by breed, but maybe by, you know, if you live in the city, if you are very active. And we, we do have all of those choices out there. Uh, and I do think there is, in some cases, a benefit, not for all breeds necessarily. And you won't always need like a breed diet, if you know what I mean. You know, if I have a Labrador in front of me that it's neutered and very with very little activity, you know, there's some things I can choose that are not necessarily a Labrador diet. But for example, Dalmatians might get some urinary issues. Specific diets may be very beneficial for them. So I do think we're going to move to towards a more individualized nutrition in the future. I do think so. I don't know when. <laughs> but Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for that. Really I think your example of Dalmatian is really what I was looking for because there are some genetic predispositions that mm -hmm. can be managed. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so very much, Dr. Cicely. Yeah, we do have a lot of gene testing now also in the U.S. especially that, you know, you can identify some risk factors and try to help not only with diet, but with other strategies. So I think we'll see more of that in the future. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great question, Dr. Tatu. To build further on this, actually based on their sizes, breeds, you know, and age, uh, different pets, cats and dogs, they face different kind of health issues and they require different kind of nutrition as well. So in fact, in Mars Pet Care, we have specialized products for different breeds. Yeah. And it's a very futuristic approach. Thank you for the great question. Thank you, Dr. Cecilia, for uh, sharing uh, your insights on this. Very helpful. And, uh, you know, proper animal gives the nutrition, the vigor to grow, reproduce, and a very healthy immune system to fight infections. And to build further on this, I request Dr. Aparajita Chakravarti to share her insights on the role of animal nutrition and veterinary education. Yeah, am I audible? Am I audible? Yeah, it's fine. So uh, thank you for the question. So uh, I have been practicing, I think, for the last 24 years in Calcutta. And uh, I have seen a lot of uh, ups and downs, many types of dogs, cats, the emerging veterinary practice, which has been, you know, uh, coming up in Calcutta because, you know, when I started, I saw that people, how they were dealing with their dogs. I mean, uh, um, they, the pets, they were not even looked after properly. And nutrition was a very uh, kind of, you know, very backward kind of a thought, you know. They never used to think about that, you know. And owning a pet, I mean, a nice breed was like a social status in Calcutta, I have seen. And I used to go and visit dog shows and see beautiful dogs. And I used to, I used to admire them. But then slowly, slowly, I realized we really lack all the basic facilities here. And people need a lot of awareness regarding nutrition and well-being of the pets. And uh, so, you know, uh, I thought of, you know, taking the initiative in my own smaller way. And uh, slowly I started, you know, educating people doing uh, shows in my own level and uh, giving uh, advices to people about the basic needs like nutrition and well-being, vaccination, everything. 
so slowly slowly i realized yes we need all this we need the basic diagnostics in kolkata i started educating myself as i thought that i was not getting uh, 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 updated on the recent um, uh, whatever uh, scientific developments are taking place all over the world so i started going and doing diplomas and short term courses to upgrade myself so that i can take care of the current problems in kolkata so that way it was a long journey and yes now after all this you know the 24th year of my practice i can see a lot of change i can see a lot of uh, awareness among people and of course now people are coming and asking me for uh, uh, the simple question like uh, what can i feed my uh, dog i have bought my new puppy and what would be the ideal food for my dog and i am so happy to make them understand give advices to them that yes this is what you have to give you know you have to give lot of protein it should be a good dog food and way back in uh, before 24 years like dog food was like a uh, kind of people used to think that it's a kind of junk food for them so they used to think okay that's a street food so why do we have to feed street food to our dogs so it's like that it's it's going to do a lot of harm to our dogs so now the concept has changed and i am really happy for that thanks to all the companies they are doing awareness programs and everything people are like now googling themselves and you know finding so many answers themselves and coming to us so that's a new uh, development and i really you know like this and uh, now i have seen you see uh, there is a recent survey where i saw that only 45% till now 45% people who buy a dog they come to the veterinary doctor to ask for a ideal diet the other people the other percentage is still not aware and they are feeding what the breeder is telling them to feed or what other friends are telling them to feed some are feeding you know which we should not be giving them to the puppies and so the pups when they come with lot of gastric issues then we have to tell them and make them understand and then they realize so i think since uh, uh, now it's a nice effort where the veterinarians the uh, ngos and uh, the municipal corporation uh, dignitaries are all here so it should be a combined effort, uh, combined effort you know to uh, uh, make the people aware and give awareness to uh, how to keep what are the well being of how to understand the well being of our pets and of course the strays also so i i i feel so happy when i see that there are so many ngos coming up in kolkata nice shelters you know uh, coming up but my request to all the people who are doing this is like uh you know why don't we start uh, uh, uh these dogs can you know help people as a therapeutic dogs why don't we why don't the shelters they go and they allow children from the school to come and interact with the dogs so that will be a you know very good um, development in our society and you know the people will become more pet friendly animal friendly and uh, regarding nutrition yes nowadays we have like when up as a practitioner i can say that when a person is coming to me so if it is a puppy i give them a puppy nutrition program and if it is a geriatric dog i give a uh, food which is really you know necessary for that kind of dog for an adult dog and who is old and who needs that kind of nutrition and yes nowadays we have lot of uh, prescription diets available for dogs who have renal issues or who have cardiac issues skin issues so that's a huge uh, you know development and we look forward to having more uh, you know uh, uh, specific things the specific kind of nutrition for the future in future and uh, i think that's all i think yeah thank you i think you made a very valid and important point understanding pet nutrition is very important and on that note i would like to request your opinion on that pet nutrition is currently not an integral part of the veterinary curriculum so how is it impacting the health of the pets and do you think there is a need that it should be made a part of the nutri- you know curriculum of the veterinary yeah so uh, uh, the veterinary education it's a five and a half years course nowadays and it includes so many things uh, 
a uh, student has to learn uh, different subjects surgery gynecology anesthesiology radiology and uh, all kind of all the branches and uh, in this five and a half years i think it is not enough you know to uh, 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 put everything you know on your nutrition part in a elaborate manner so um, yes so that's why i think the uh, the span of this education is less according to and there are so many species to be considered so it's really tough i think veterinary education studying veterinary science nowadays is tougher than studying human uh, uh, mbbs so uh, that's what i feel it's my opinion i don't know about others but yes and so in this short span you know studying everything and putting everything into practice is difficult but yes uh, with the uh, new c uh, education program now we have this continuous education program all over the world even in our national level as well as in it's globally so nowadays you know after passing out after passing out the veterinary uh, graduation a student can uh, if the student is interested if the doctor is interested they can pursue so many clinical nutrition uh, courses available there are short term courses there are long term courses so anyone can do that and uh, you know uh, make their uh, make its importance felt in the society and in the you know pet industry so uh, what i did in my case i also when i graduated i thought my knowledge is not enough to serve the pet population as i was a private practitioner so you know i took up all those short term courses to upgrade myself and learn about the different aspects of nutrition you know in nutrition also there are different parts there is uh, uh, nutrition for the puppies there is nutrition for critical care patients there is nutrition for different nutrition for geriatric patients so you know we have to understand those points where and what kind of nutrition we have to give and offer to our pet uh, parents yeah thank you dr prajita dr subir what are your thoughts on this uh, you know if we include the pet nutrition as a subject to the veterinary curriculum will that help maintaining the health and well-being of cats and dogs thank you thank you very much for raising this question the veterinary education is dependent on the national policy every country has a national policy a national standard for their veterinary education we have a common course pan india that is bvc and h course cs is so a five and a half years of course and our standard uh is a livestock so we have, we also in our curriculum uh we study nutrition but then this is this is completely on the livestock nutrition so there is no dart of education in our system the canine nutrition definitely doesn't con constitute our course curriculum that is the there is a setback there is a setback at this point and within this within the periphery of this room because we are discussing canine and feline nutrition or small animal nutrition or shelter nutrition that is the issue that doesn't mean the veterinarians doesn't know when whenever they are out of the of their college as a doctor they are practicing they feel the undercurrent that they have to know about it and they elevate their knowledge and accordingly they shape themselves and test themselves into the practices and provide the proper guidance to the end users clients and to the clients uh, the pets thank you dr subhi um, so I, we understand it is late evening for dr cecilia thank you dr cecilia so much for joining us today and uh, sharing your insights with us and uh, thank you so much Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for the great questions. Now, moving tracks from animal nutrition to pet food standards. We understand that how important it is to understand animal nutrition. At the same time, I would say it is equally important to have pet food standards and regulations in place to make sure that pets are actually getting the right nutrition. 
yeah and with that note i'm moving tracks from nutrition to pet food standard and i request dr miss nitasha dogar to narrate her ideas on uh, how pet food standards and regulations can strengthen the approach towards focusing on pet nutrition nitasha ma'am please yeah thank you akanksha for your question so as i have already mentioned in my opening remarks that uh, standards are very crucial to ensure animal health and safety and uh, the standards which we prepare are prepared through a process of consultation it's a very democratic system of formulation of standards so where the views of all the stakeholders are taken into consideration and standards are based on scientific and techn technological research so it is very important that these standards are implemented uh, across uh, the nation so as to provide a level playing field to all and, and uh, about regulations bis doesn't have a role as a regulator so the standards that we prepare are essentially uh, the national standards which are voluntary in nature compliance to these standards can be made uh, mandatory through uh, regulations as of now the standard on pet food is not under mandatory certification but uh, if it it comes under mandatory certification it is always a good move to discipline the market to have good quality products in the market and to enhance competitiveness in the industry also so uh, that is what uh, my views are on this thank you ma'am thank you for highlighting the importance of having pet food standards to ensure the health and overall well-being of pets in fact at mars pet care ensuring that pets get the right nutrition in the right quantities is at the center of everything we do dr badhumita what are your thoughts on this how uh, a pet food regulation and a standard will benefit the overall health and well being of cats and dogs thank you actually uh, i'm not assistant director additional director anyway uh, i'm from fisheries background so my uh, one small question uh, to you that is the what's the protein source of animal food rather uh, dog and cat food that is quite interesting because most of the time i have seen yeah i'm basically microbiology is my subject that is disease and other things so maybe disease time i can give you some inputs and uh, uh, for nutrition purpose i have a uh, i'm facing some problem that is sometimes we are using dry fish as a protein source sometimes maybe animal but from where the source of the protein that is key um, my point is that is a key point because most of the cases for dry fish dry fish we are using formalin formaldehyde and it's uh, highly you know uh, uh, carcinogenic and a highly problematic food problematic chemical for human body also for the animal body and sometimes we are using the other other source that is also may be contaminated with pesticides and other things so that is the key point i think for nutrition of the all kind of pets that is the where we are getting the protein food that has to be ensured for the pets so this is my concern and i have done lot of work on that especially for formalin detection with rajabaja science college in another area uh, so i think that's a great question uh, ma'am and uh, when we say quality protein um, actually there are two parameters one it has to be highly digestible that can be digested well as dr cecilia was mentioning it has to be digested well by cats and dogs number one and number two the amino acid profile that is there it has to be closely relevant to close you know cats and dogs so that those are the two important criteria and as you mentioned about formaldehyde so you know only those additives and uh, preservatives or you know anything that is added should be in accordance to the standards and it should have proven record of safety actually formaldehyde there is no standard for using formaldehyde safe standard it's harmful yes it should okay. not be used yeah uh, it should not use like i am not interested about the source of the protein i am not talking about the amino acid percentage how many percentage you are using what kind of amino acid that's not the question the source of protein from where you are getting the protein in the food i think dr yeah. cecilia had uh, touched upon this topic and 
how she mentioned that there could be different uh, sources for protein it could be from animal sources it could also be from plant sources it could yeah. also be from a mixed sources so yeah there are variety of sources available yeah, but in india where we are giving food to the street dog and in other things i don't think we are caring about all these things thank Very you thought provoking question thank you Now, having discussed the very important topics of animal nutrition and pet food standards and regulations, moving to the next important topic that is One Health. One Health is actually an approach that recognizes the health of people is closely connected to the health of animals as well as the shared environment, and it is an approach of uh, very uh, effectively treating the outbreaks of diseases and health issues. With us today. Uh, is Dr. Utpal Tatu, who is an expert proponent of this area. So I request Dr. Tatu to share his ideas on this subject and to help us understand this concept better. Thank you, Dr. Akanksha, uh, <clears throat> for introducing this topic. Again, thanks for this wonderful discussion. Um, you know, I will somehow connect this topic um, to the pet nutrition also. I would say so that there's continuity. You know, Dr. Cecilia and others very nicely mentioned uh, nutrition and health, how they are connected, and we are enlightened by that, and we all concur. Malnutrition, obviously, compromised health. Malnutrition results in immunocompromise, and that's where the disease connection comes in. Imagine a stray dog on the streets, you know, getting food from leftovers from plastic bags. I mean, far from balanced diet. It's just barely surviving, highly immunocompromised, and thereby a great danger in many ways because it's carrying infection, it is suffering, it is actually um, uh, chronically ill through exposure to various infectious diseases that some of the experts like Dr. Parajita, Dr. Murli will tell us more about. What I want to tell you is that um, you mentioned the word One Health. And this is what I've been sort of practicing for over a decade now, that human society always looks at human health as of paramount importance, forgetting that human health cannot actually be looked upon in isolation. Human health, if you want to be healthy, we really have to look at the environment altogether, animals, birds, soil, water, around everything around us. And we are talking here today about animals and in the midst, still in the midst of the pandemic, I would like to remind you that uh, COVID-19 emerged out of, uh, you know, bat we think or something similar. While I still talk about COVID-19, today's newspaper will tell you about monkeypox. Many of you don't know that monkeypox actually emerged again out of animals, not monkey, but prairie dog. Prairie dog, I mind you, is not a dog, luckily, it's not a canine, but prairie dog is a kind of a squirrel, a rodent. So rodent was supposedly the first carrier from which monkeypox was transmitted to humans in 1970 first, 68, 70. And then, of course, in West Africa, Central Africa, it, you know, it was, it read itself, eventually showing up again, not only in underdeveloped nations like Africa, but today there are thousands of cases as we speak in the United States of America. This is the reality. I mean, how can we not see it? It's written on the wall. And I think, you know, we just turning a blind eye to this, what you might call a ticking time bomb. Even though we have seen COVID-19, we really have to do much more to make sure that animals are safe, they are free of infections. It's good for the animals, but also for humans. And one way to do that is, of course, optimal diet, which I think wonderful to hear that mass is doing in its own way eat, strays, and so on, and we all, they, we just can't do enough. There are over 30 million strays in India, altogether 80 million. These are the numbers that I heard from Mr. Nitin today. How are we going to cope with it? 6% growth rate. Imagine the numbers next year. Imagine the numbers next year. Nothing that we will do will be enough, but all we can do is try. And it's wonderful to see today the initiative taken by Mars Pet Care to dwell on this important topic. Thank you so very much, Dr. Akash. Thank you, sir. I would say this is very eye-opening to understand this approach, how the efforts by just one sector are not sufficient to eliminate or prevent the problem. 
it has to be a holistic approach. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Sir. So while we are discussing about One Health, I request Dr. Tapapriya Majumdar, sir, to share your ideas and views on the all the stakeholders coming together from, you know, from NGOs, citizens, corporates, government, and acting as a proponent of One Health. Actually, KMC has its own infrastructure for public safety that I have already said. Now, different NGOs approach us. In fact, our public safety staff, they're well connected with people like uh, personalities like Kaneka Gandhi, and we have frequent talks with her. All of her complaints, most of the complaints, she gets a complaint from Kolkata right to Delhi. And from there, we cater what she wants. In that case, we have a lot of NGOs wanting our help regarding this public safety. Now, since uh, one thing we don't have is that proper uh, animal hospital, dog hospital. We have acres and acres of land in our Dhapa dog pound. Where easily a big, at least a hundred kennel hospital can be built. But you know, in government, anything just takes a long time and a long process. That's we, what we think we cannot do it right now, but there are plans that we're doing it. But these programs we are having, these frequent programs of sterilizing stray dogs and vaccinating stray dogs. In fact, I have done my vaccination of stray dogs myself. Uh, these things we are continuing. And any NGOs wanting to help us, we always entertain them. We always uh, extend money. We want their cooperation. And if they want our cooperation, we are ready to help. Thank you, sir. Great perspective, sir. Having pets comes with numerous uh, benefits. You know, they make our lives more livable. You, they make uh, great companions. They even teach us good things as well. So, with that, Doctor Miss uh, Sharda Radhakrishnan, ma'am, what are your views on how they make this world a better place for us? You know, and <clears throat> I run an animal hospital called Chaya and I have 500 plus dogs there on any given day admitted as dog patients, abandoned. We have one-legged, two-legged, three-legged dogs, all of them. And that is the most stress-free time of my day when I'm there among them. You just look at a dog and, you know, the, the eyes of the dog they relate to you in such a beautiful way. They just want you to kind of cuddle them and, you know, pet them. That's all they require. And therefore, it improves human health. It actually, there are so many studies which say blood pressure will be controlled and you walk with your dog, your diabetes is under control, definitely. But then also the sad part is that there are the pets in home which are like children of which in our families. And then those street children living on the pavements, those are our street dogs, which don't get that much care as home-owned pets do. So when we talk about nutrition, you see the dogs on the road, I mean, even NGOs when they are working, it's very difficult for us to give them any kind of uh, pet food on a regular basis because we simply can't afford it is beyond their reach. So we try our best taking care of their health. If the dog on the street is taken care of, definitely human health surrounding it is also taken care of. We hope for the best after that. We just leave it to powers of us. So uh, I'll request Dr. Satrupa Sanya now and uh, how does she think that pets make this world a better place for us? Dr. Satrupa Sanya? Ms. Sushmita Lahiri. <laughs> Hi. So, um, 
please share your ideas on you know uh, what kind of challenges you face while managing these phase and what kind of challenges you see um, for, you know in terms of healthcare facilities that are available for strays and pets both hello everybody actually lots of since i i i uh, floated an ngo called voice for animals in april 2010 I am an ardent animal lover and this burning compassion for animals make me found the voice for animals this ngo compassion for animals is a divine feeling today in this forum of distinguished fellow panelists and guests i would like to share some of my thoughts and feelings in line with today's topics and agenda First and foremost I strongly feel that every house in your cities or villages should take care of at least one or couple of stray dogs in their localities in terms of providing them food and health care then the major problem of innumerable stray dogs going hungry and suffering ill health without treatment can be mitigated to a great extent I personal personally feed 200 street dogs every day with chicken rice and sometimes with pedigree and all this kind of dry foods and uh find that we have to face lots of challenges regarding um, uh, giving treatment to street dogs as well as feeding them because local people due to lack of awareness they sometimes want the feel that the stray dogs are a menace for the roads and they try to get rid of them by uh, asking us to relocate them somewhere else which is against law so we should uh, bring more awareness among common people so they uh, feel uh, they don't feel threatened by the menace of stray dogs and all and that we can do in num- numerous ways uh i personally feel that if all the ngos irrespective of their operating scale to their capacities can dedicatedly may take measures of conducting animal birth control program alongside vaccination drive that can result in a controlled number of our canine friends on the roads which also will make the roads safer for humans if the canine population is properly sterilized and vaccinated then humans will also feel safer on the roads thank you ma'am last but not the least i also feel that if bodies like animal welfare board of india or the state animal welfare boards can introduce and implement stringent measures of checking the rampant breeding of domestic dogs as doing uh, so has severe health implication on dogs they will enjoy good health and pet and domestic dogs have to be well treated and maintained with love and humanity and if the same could be a checkpoint for the animal welfare boards then i am certain that pet dogs will not be subjected to any maltreatment by their owners and will enjoy a good quality of life so having said all that let's do our bit to make sure we make this planet a happy place for all our furry friends let's give them their much deserved love and care and make them feel loved wanted and cared for thank yeah. you so thank you as we were discussing about one health approach we understood that uh, working towards uh, managing the health and welfare of pets is cannot is something that cannot be done in silo it has to be a multi sectorial approach so with that note i request dr tapapriya majumdar sir what are your views on uh, you know on public private partnership uh how can that design policies for the betterment of pets actually we have a number of ngos who are engaged in this type of work so most of them are doing excellent work for example i know of an ngo which was previously once in this run by devasti roy 
and uh, one of our staff rajiv ghosh he is very much closely associated with her he has narrated to me what are the jobs they are doing and i think that if these type of ngos they carry on this type of job then the corporation will be in a very good position in contributing to the public safety if they get cooperation from all these ngos these are my views thank you sir thank you very enlightening and with this we come to the end of this panel discussion and uh, you know when i was first introduced to this category i used to think uh, why can't pets have the same food that we have so from that day to today when we have discussed and understood how important it is to understand animal nutrition and at the same time how important it is to have pet food standards regulations policies public private partnerships working towards one health approach you know with this note i like to really thank all our panelist guest and the audience for a very insightful and enriching discussion thank you so much thank you akanksha there was indeed a very uh, invigorating discussion as well and uh, thank you all the panelists for uh, you know for your views and uh, for 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 participating and you know really telling from the heart what it is that is required today so thank you and uh, now for the second panel our panel moderator is uh, mr samik goshal a proud indie pet parent and an ardent pet lover samik has been with mars pet pet care for 3 years leading the amazon business uh, before joining mars samik led the e-commerce business for louis philip working with aditya birla fashion and retail limited he holds an mba from the indian institute of foreign trade delhi and a btech from the national institute of T technology raurkela he firmly believes that love has no breed so over to you samik thank you so much vasudha for that kind introduction indeed uh, love has no breed uh, first off i'd like to welcome our esteemed guests on the dais our chief guest and the guests of honor all of the esteemed panelists thank you so much for being here today with us taking time out for this noble cause and uh, stakeholders in the audience stakeholders from the media from ngos from the corporation right uh, i'd like to touch upon what uh, madam sharda radhakrishnan just mentioned you know when you look into the eyes of a dog of a be it a stray dog or be it a pet in your house the kind of love that you feel or you know the kind of bond sense of bonding that you feel that's what makes our lives better right so isn't it our responsibility to make a better city for them right better cities for these pets so that's the topic for the second panel discussion better cities for pets at home and on the streets i would like to quickly introduce our panel here uh, we have dr s chini krishna who is joining us online of course sir we heard your inaugural address and it was very inspiring thank you uh, we have dr romila mondal she is uh, a post doctoral researcher at the indian institute of science education and research iiscr kolkata welcome ma'am Uh, we have uh, dr utpal das also joining us virtually online thank you sir for being here with us superintendent uh, veterinary officer kolkata municipal corporation thank you so much sir for being a part of our esteemed panel uh, we have mr s raman uh, who secretary of calcutta kennel club welcome sir uh, we have miss neela tatu also again uh, i'd go virtual miss neela tatu has joined us from bangalore uh, she's uh, involved in a lot of animal welfare activities and an ngo in bangalore uh we next we have dr mulidhar uh, thank you so much sir being here he is president of the vet society for animal welfare and rural development welcome sir we also have miss shanti das boshak thank you so much ma'am for joining us she is additional special superintendent of police cid uh thank you so much ma'am for taking time out uh, being a part of this session we have mr sujay raha uh he is from popet healthcare kolkata looking forward to the discussion uh, sujay ji uh, thank you so much for gracing the occasion we have arijit mukherjee he is a uh, part of cats and dogs and he is an ardent animal lover and animal activist as well welcome arijit we have miss mopia banerji uh, from ashari which comes under the aegis of people for animals pfa i had the good fortune of visiting ashari some days back and it's inspiring the kind of work uh, your organization or even organizations like chaya are doing right so i i'd, I'd uh, like to first start by uh, calling upon dr chini krishna uh, sir if you're there if i can bring you in for the first question uh, yes uh, dr chini krishna uh, are you there uh, can you hear me sir uh, i'd like to bring I'm you here. in i'm here 
Thank you so much, sir. So I'd like to bring you in for the first question, just to set the context and define what does better cities for pets at home and better cities for pets on the streets, our companion animals on the streets, mean to you, and how can we set the context for this discussion? As I already mentioned, a street is really no place for a dog. Cats are a little different, but even for a, a domesticated cat, uh, every uh, cat and dog deserves a good home. The uh, the fact remains that you know it was our irresponsibility that got the cats and dogs onto the street because of our allowing them to reproduce when we were not able to keep them properly at home. It is, uh, it is now our responsibility to make sure that this, this problem is tackled in the most humane way possible, which means that every animal welfare organization should concentrate on its animal birth control program as an integral part of the work that they are doing. Thank you, sir. I think you set the context and the point that you've closed your uh, uh, initial address with is aggressive ABC is what I understand, right, sir? So I think I'd like to uh, bring in Dr. Rubina Mandel. Ma'am, what do you think, uh, while obviously there are ABC activities being carried out in pockets, and that's how you can reduce the population of strays, thereby making it a better city for pe pets on the streets. How do you think this can be implemented in a much more structured manner, not just in Calcutta, but across the country, and scaled up significantly so that the compound annual growth rate of 6% of pets we can somehow mitigate that and control the population. Hi, everyone, and thanks for the question. So uh, it is estimated that you need uh, ABC coverage of around 70% of the dogs to have a, uh, mm, a statistically significant uh, reduction in the number of dogs over a period of like uh, five to 10 years, because this is not going to be an overnight effect that you can see. But uh, however, having said that, it's like uh, the uh, kind of efforts that are being put in by whether it's by the individual by individuals or shelters, they are like putting in tiny drops where we need to put where we need to make the effort to actually have a big effort at one time so that there is a noticeable difference in the number of uh, dogs that are uh, that should be there on the streets and. Not just ABC. This needs to be uh, uh, there. Like there needs to be efforts to have the dogs which are being neutered, uh, taken into homes, and being adopted, and not just left on the streets. Because ABC does not just guarantee the welfare of an animal. It just uh, prevents it from mating and and reproducing. So our focus should not just be on the population control, but also on the welfare of the animals that are existing on the streets. So it needs to be coupled with adoption. That's what I think. Right. A very pertinent point. I think uh, I heard you on ABC and I'll move to uh, Ms. Mopia Banerjee. And of course, then I'll move to adoption as well. Uh, ABC, of course, like we've discussed, is a significant uh, action area through which we can bring down the population. And your NGO has been doing a lot of ABCs, right? However, what are the kind of challenges that you face around sterilization as a concept and how do you think we can scale it up? What is your experience with the whole piece? Uh, thank you, Samik, for the question. So when we are talking about sterilization, uh, it's not only about birth control measure. It takes care of a lot of things, actually, because uh, when you're sterilizing a dog, when you're you know taking control of the mating thing, it, it means it also guarantees uh, limitation in cancer uh, and TVT cases. Because the more the dogs are mating, they keep on spreading uh, each other. And the second thing is that uh, when there's low mating rates or, uh, you know, the dogs are you know uh, not coming in heat, that means there are less fights, which also takes control of maggot wounds. So it's not only about uh, limiting the population, but it's also helping in a lot of... Uh, follow-up treatments, right? Uh, that is one thing. Second is when we are talking about sterilization, uh, we need to, you know, the problems if you talk about when we are addressing an area, yeah? When we are addressing an area, the first thing is that, you know, having people coming forward to help us identify the dog, someone taking responsibility, you know, being on spot and uh, coming up as a caregiver or a point of coordination. 
that is a big thing that we you know uh, we often find people that no raste ka kutta why should we take the responsibility yeah but that is not the thing someone has to come forward and when we are talking about a better uh, city for pets and pets in a broader scale including the one at home and the, uh, on the streets uh, we you know when we stop differentiating among dogs or any breeds in particular that is the first thing that can you know create a better uh, city for and better environment for the animals because uh, when we are seeing you know uh, pedigree dogs on advertisement you know and uh, for example you know when uh, hutch was promoting with uh, pug buck yeah so obviously people you know uh, pug is a friendly breed pug sales also increased exactly same went for golden retrievers uh, some brands were promoting beagle as well so and now people are coming up with promoting indies in the advertisement and public uh, people and public figures coming up with a post of indies and they are showing that they are you know um, adopting indies that is creating awareness so the, gradually the awareness is happening but we need to aware more people and connect with more people and that is how you know and uh, that is where uh, sterilization programs also comes in the more we sterilize the population we are limiting that way we are helping uh, uh, creating a better environment for the animals mostly and of course for the human beings as well right thank you mopia i think uh, what the take away here is sterilization is not only for birth control it is for disease mitigation it is vaccination and it is to control their aggressiveness aggression thereby making them much more habitable adoptable right so a very natural progression to this is adoption right now i am a proud pet parent to an 11 year old beautiful indi and uh, there is no other person or entity alive on this planet that i love more however i do not think my indi or indies on the streets get the kind of love that they deserve um arijit what is your point of view how can we break these barriers of adoption you know you saw charlie as a movie and suddenly labrador demands have picked up now how do we promote I mean, let's say a movie on indies or promote awareness so that uh, this there are these barriers that we can you know surmount when you're talking about uh, better city for pets and you ask what do you mean by better city of pets like i opted for a place called salt lake in kolkata it comes under bidhanagar municipal corporation unfortunately bidhanagar municipal corporation doesn't have any infrastructure for veterinary services so there's no vet work for them and what happens if we find our stray dog met in an accident we have to have we have to actually get help from private practitioners but there are a lot of private practitioners are not very keen to come and help when it comes up for accident of stray animals kmc people just mentioned they have infrastructures now i have a gentleman from uh, belgachi veterinary hospital i request if vidhanagar doesn't have a veterinary support why don't we get certain amount of support from them so that we can have actually a better city a better place for stray animals in salt lake uh, for other all ngos like ashari and chaya they have their own limitations so we can't expect them to run out every parts and corners in kolkata to feed or take care of the stray animals now coming to the point like we been knowing about two uh, dogs called mudul hound and raja palaya they are also in the dogs Indeed, right absolutely now why don't we have certain amount of promotions or their pictures on the packets of the foods available from different brands we why it's indi it's a indian pariya yes absolutely indian pariya dog that's what so we call them. why call with them on the indi indian pariyas they are mongrels indian pariyas now uh, they are the like human beings are aware of controlling their reproductive system but not the animals they don't have any kind of family plannings they don't have any kind of productions and other stuff we are the people who have to educate them how educate that mopia told me about told us like neutering is one of the best part but in the same time we have to have a lot of awareness of speeding cars on the road this the dog doesn't know how the car comes and what happens after they hit we have to have public awareness we have to have support from the police they has to we have some kind of laws that you can't just go and hit a stray animal and say rasa gutta tha no there are a lot of things has to be coming from the administrative part like ngos are private bodies they are not administrative administration has to have certain amount of 
support given to the ngos or a some similar uh, individual working for st animals now otherwise it's very difficult to maintain things so i think uh, the lot of has to be team work and any kind of team work has to have us hum mane it has to be not i it has to be we all of us all of us all of us in this room probably all of us coming together right uh, mr sujay i'll come to you ma'am uh, shanti das goshak ma'am thank you so much for gracing this occasion we just heard about you know the police and we've heard a lot of good work being done by the police i think i've heard from arijit as well uh, but there are two aspects that i would like to touch uh, i would like you to touch upon one would be on cruelty cases which are uh, regular human cruelty towards our companion animals on the streets how can we reduce these instances of cruelty through legal ways through tighter action uh, that is one how do you deal with cruelty cases for uh, uh, companion animals on the street and second is all of these cases of let's say a hit and run where probably it is not very intentional but it happens as an accident on the streets how can we mitigate that and as as a whole community not just the police of course you've been doing brilliant job how can we come together and reduce such instances to make a better city for pets first of all uh, good morning to all the uh, eminent persons present over here uh to begin with actually uh, i have been uh, in touch with orijit for long so when i was uh, uh, 10 years back uh, when i was assistant commissioner of police bidhan nagar i used to get certain uh, complaints but the complaints are not regarding uh, cruelty against animal uh the complaints are like this uh, some people are there who used to feed the street dogs and street cats the complaints are like this the person who is feeding she or he is a insane or a mad person so we we used to used to complain get complaints like this and moreover what everybody is uh, uh, means everybody will agree and uh, some, like dr aprajita and arijit they have already mentioned it that awareness is the main thing people should be compass- compassionate it should come from here love what you propagate so basically it's love and it should come from here so cruelty against animal the laws are very weak it's a cognizable offense that means anyone can be arrested but when there is a heat and run case no compl- we get no complaints so that is very important people think that our time is so important that we cannot uh, spare our time we cannot go to the police and lodge a complaint so let a street da- dog like die like that only so basically one has to be compassionate uh, one has to be aware because the whole society basically needs to be aware regarding this and the laws are not that strong so uh, it's very difficult to take any legal actions the section under ipc is 42720 a 428 and 429 they are very weak sections and all the three sections are available the penal section is only 428 and it's available so until and unless the penal sections will be strong enough so that you can punish a person and the uh, fine amount is also starts from 25000 it can go up to 1 lakh but for three third consecutive case only so first of all the penal sections and are so weak that you cannot take action properly and if even if you lodge a complaint against anyone and he goes to the uh, police station and gets bail from there only then you cannot uh, take any action that's why uh, uh from legal aspect it's uh, it's really very difficult but uh, and that is the only re- only way that uh, is that we can create awareness and uh, we can take all the ca- cases very in a very compassionate way and uh, i am always there i i have been working uh, for the welfare of the animals not only pets street dogs i have rescued many wild animal uh, animals who are in the purview of the wild animals category uh, i have rescued mongoose 
and that mongoose was with me in my home for one and a half years and after that i left uh, i release him to one of the uh, forest under uh, vidhan nagar only so i have rescued squirrels just seven three four days old squirrels and again i have released them and now i have uh, eight pet pets in my house so it's my personal interest i am doing all those things out of i have not purchased a single pet all of them are rescued and they are with me only because they feel that they should be with me because uh, the pigeon which i rescued uh, it's a handicap one he can't fly so he stayed back so in this way and the most important thing is the uh, thing is that uh, in my house there are cats which i have rescued and pigeons and uh, again a uh, handicapped parakeet uh, jung- jungly parakeet so predator and prey they stay in harmony but i fa- uh, but in our society uh, means those loving dogs and those loving animals we can't stay in harmony with them we always try to harm them so first of all what i think is that uh, the laws should be very, uh, more strict and so that the law enforcement agency can work on it until and unless the laws are strong we can't do anything so first of all the laws laws should be uh, much more strict Uh, their enforcement should be strict and the next is that awareness awareness is i will uh, give very much stress on awareness because it is uh, I, for my in my this 12 years of service i have found the only thing uh, which can help in every regard is the awareness and cooperation among all the all the uh, departments of the society and all the uh, stakeholders of the society so in that way that cooperation and awareness and strictness of uh, law is much more required thank you so much ma'am i think uh, very important sentence that you mentioned predator and prey live in harmony in your house i think we can have a big round of applause for ma'am she is a shining beacon of hope ma'am for you and the entire police department whatever you are doing thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts and what i heard from you is first of course is care compassion and love second is the laws need to be more stringent perhaps advocacy public policy making and forums like such as these can push for stronger laws so that law enforcement can work uh, and all sections of the society need to come together to make this happen right on that point uh, mr sujay just like to bring you in on adoption of course like we discussed right um, how can we break the barriers ad- around adoption because if suddenly adoption increases there will be lesser pets on the streets and at a compounding rate of adoptions we'll probably have a better cities for pets right Your right view. right uh, thank you for the question uh, see uh, well uh, mainly i would like to ask uh, this ngos those who are helping for adoption mainly chaya and ashari all are doing very well work so i would like to request them that if they put some you know what happened a person love to get attacked attracted with a small puppies okay at the first point but after a few months or after few years they suffered a lot so we can't put a gun on anyone's head to keep the dog that you have to keep the dog and all so many times we get a recent uh, result that the dog they used to ad- abandon the dog those dogs so i would like to request those uh, this um, uh ngos that uh, to put some uh, chip or to make something you know something advanced technology should be there otherwise uh, we used to found many dogs on the roads so it's better to put some chips or something we should have some uh, technology so that we can trace the owners to get him back so this is my request all that thing i can say thank you uh, mr sujay very good point dr muliyadhar i'd also like to bring you in on the whole adoption piece what's your view uh, the way sujay mentioned there are challenges around adoption then dogs get adopted but probably the right temperament or the right bonding is not there and then they get abandoned we'll come to abandonment also sir but what's your view on adoption how do we supersede these barriers uh, first of all uh, good morning everyone when natural calamity or when pandemic comes 
the human kind. The human kind goes to the animal kind. As long as there was no, there is no bonding with the pets, animals. When the crisis come like COVID, every people has gone to the dogs and animals as a pets. During the COVID time, the number of pet parents and the number of pet dogs adoption has increased. It's doubled in other in, in other words, it's doubled. Though some people in the during the COVID, some people they left abandoned their dogs, but only by this hearing to the rumors that even dogs can spread the COVID. But even their children also got the COVID, but they have not abandoned the ch children. But the dogs because they are wiseless. But many of them, uh, only the many of the pet parents, uh, the, the pet parenting during the COVID has increased a lot. And after increasing, and uh, when the dogs are coming into the in the home, and the adoptions are being increased, still a lot of adoptions has to be increased. We are, as uh, Nitin said, it's a 80 million, uh, million dogs we have in the India. How to mitigate this problem? It's not overnight cannot uh, happen, and it's not with the only few NGOs, um, say about 100 for 150, 200 NGOs. That is a very, very uh, small number to address the problem. Seven crores of pet uh, stray dog population to be adopted. That should be the drive. That should be the target. Issue is and it's not only the we NGOs or some officials, some companies doing this policy will not help. But government should take and think something and bring some strict policy. We are 125, 130 crores of population in India. At least seven crores of population can't be addressed. With the 50 of you, let us assume that if you know, 50 percent of the households. Even 50% of households, even less than that, seven, seven crores of households out of 125 crores. If you take one puppy into as adoption, this problem is mitigated. And now is this no meeting, no kind of meeting is required to address them. Because those actions are not being done. That's the reason today we are meeting. And at least not today we have made an initiation. We have made an initiative by the boss to take this, address this problem. At least see, some, everything starts with something. So that's what today what we are doing and already they are done in Bangalore, Hyderabad, Chennai, Delhi and today is in Kolkata. We thank the Mars for that. And coming to the shelters, shelters is the how many, that is the most required thing for the general street dogs, addressing the street dogs concerns, their diseases and when they are hit and run as Madam told and when they are sick. There's no one to win. Only two or three NGOs I'm seeing here. Two or three NGOs for the population like Calcutta. How we can mitigate the problem? They might be doing only for 100, 200 dogs. But such a number of NGOs to be encouraged, more number of NGOs to be included. They should be empaneled with the, uh, the corporations of uh, the concerned municipal corporation. And they have to work together. At least um, for Calcutta, I believe at least not less than 80 to 100 NGOs are required to mitigate the problem of the stray dogs in Calcutta. And now that the pond, what we have, the 280 capacity of the pond will not help in any ways. And as you mentioned, when the dog uh, uh, gets hurt, they get met with an accident, who is then going to take care? So private practice, definitely not. We cannot see. When the stray dog is met with an accident, the person needs to go and handle the stray dog. It's not that uh, going and treating. Someone has to go there and you have to uh, leave the dog and uh, just do the first aid and then bring it to the hospital. This is a skilled work. This is a labor and trained work. This will not happen only the one NGO working for a such total city. The what about the rest of the part of the cities of the animals? So this is a, this is all the things the administration, local administration, local body has to think and uh, collaborate with the um, existing NGOs, encourage NGOs. And uh, the shelters has to be increased and the number of capacity of the shelters to be increased to address the problems. And the stray dog ambulances to be adopted at least not less than one. It is not less than 10 ambulances for stray dogs for the 24 hours having a special hospital for the stray dogs to be. Uh, I request the corporation to look into that and uh, if you will be grateful if you do that and you'll be the first person, the first corporation in the India if you do that. So definitely it's our request for and coming to the ABC program. ABC program you see now again is the number comes the seven, uh, seven cross of ABC animal birth control operations. We are, I'm running an NGO and uh, we have done more like for four lakhs operation across India, all over India. That, is that the figure what we are looking at? Are we reaching the ABC program as what the WHO says that at least 
in two breeding cycles we need to re, uh, we need to do the 70 percent of the abc programs when you are not doing the 70 percent population the number of the water the money we are investing what is the number of operation you are doing what are the expenses being incurred and that is going to be waste because in one breeding cycle dogs the proliferate uh, the proliferation rates are very so that is the reason when i when I, wherever we go wherever whichever municipality call us for that to take up the activity then i request them if you are starting the program see that it will run till the end of the program don't stop middle of the program if you are stopping the middle of the program the, pro, the program the tender what you are calling for it is going to the money what you spend some crores or rupees at least 3 crores 5 crores what you have spent that money is going to be waste if it will take take little t- till the end of the program then only start the program unless until you make the infrastructure for the straight dogs uh, abc program we don't take up and please don't start the program also the minimum facility and you should count the number of the sub, uh, population of uh, kolkata city what is the straight dog population and uh, how to approach within uh, at least for uh, keep a target period two years period how to approach how to reach the two or two years period this many number of operations so that many NGOs, how many NGOs we have across India, we have very less number of NGOs to take up the ABC programs. When Chinnikrishna sir was the vice president, he was the person who was encouraged. But now is the very less number of NGOs in the across India is very less number of NGOs. And uh, so my request is please find more number of NGOs and the local body to collaborate with them and more the ABC to be done if they within two billion, the aggressive ABC to be done as one thing. And coming to the, the social status of the stray dogs and paid dogs, we need to, now the, the situation has come now. The animals also given be equal rights. The animals also have the right to live. Animals have the right to food. So they have the right to we have this facility like what which our children has. So in the same way, the Telangana government, uh, we made them to do a dog park. They're maintaining the dog park now. Now every state government, they are coming with a slogan. We are a pet friendly city. Now Hyderabad is the one, and now next uh, Ludhiana they are going to claim that they are also pet friendly city. For that they are making some infrastructure for the, the facilities for the dogs and cats. Can we have the photos, please? Just you see that this is the dog park which is uh, being um, maintained by us in uh, Hyderabad. Uh, can we have the picture up, please? This is a wonderful place for the pets and uh, the owners in Hyderabad, they bring, uh, bring in the, uh, to the dog park, they play with them, the dogs are left, all, uh, left to lay, uh, leash, leash out all the dogs and all the dogs they keep on playing in the entire park, so 1.8 acres uh, the, uh, the park is, please go to the, um, keep on scrolling. This is the ambience is uh, created, by, uh, created in the Hyderabad city. And the pet owners, they come, they enjoy their pets uh, while running, while playing, and and the pets also, they learn the socializing. And you see, many of the pets, this is the only a small number, but in our so short weekends, we get about uh, 200 to 300 dogs. All the dogs are leashed out without any belt and then. All the dogs are leashed out, and then they get socialized like this. The pet owners, they get socialized. They get emotionally connected. So uh, every city now is coming up with the uh, dog parks now. The, uh, to claim them as a pet friendly city. Even Ludhiana is going to start now. So these are the things what I would like to say. Yeah, this, this, is, this is beautiful, Dr. Mulidhar. I think we can have a big round of applause for this. This is exactly what better cities for pets calling, looks like, calling. right? Pet friendly parks. And uh, this was one of our key points uh, in the discussion for pets at home. How do we make a better city? I think just, uh, you know, Scaling this up to multi-city levels, having more and more pet-friendly parks, not just for our pets at home, but for our companion animals as well, can make a beautiful, uh, better city for pets. Uh, uh, on that Above note, yes. Uh, coming to the business, now uh, since we are uh, discussing of the pet nutrition and the straight dog nutrition also. Straight dog nutrition because we no one is uh, we having an eye on that, we are, uh, no one is going to feed them every day. Now I can um, request a mass to develop a product small uh, nutrition balls something so and give to the have some r and d give the nutrition balls to the um, animal lovers and all just by giving the nutritional food it should sub, uh, su- supplement all the nutrition requirements so this will be a great opportunity for the as a business also and well health care facilities now the in many cities all the pet practitioners also in the clinics now we are upgraded now now we have got all the equipments we got earlier we used to import otherwise we used to depend on the 
human labs now every pet hospital most of the pet hospital we have self equipped so that the facility can be used for the state dogs and the municipal corporation also collaborate with the state, uh, the private pet pet practitioners and uh, give them the opportunity to serve the stray dogs and e pay for the uh, for the service they are rented this is a good business community to help the stray dogs thank you so much thank you uh, dr murlidhar i think a great address there you've given us a holistic picture and at the beginning or the, uh, at the forefront of that picture was more and more shelters ngos being equipped being empowered more and more ambulances for shelters and ngos to uh, work with abc awareness adoption etc we have mr ajay daga joining in from ashari as well sir i'll come to you thank you for joining us and of course uh, uh, raman sir i'll also come to you before that we'll move to our uh, online uh, panelists uh, dr utpal das i'd like you to come in please superintendent veterinary officer kolkata municipal corporation sir are you there with us you've been there since the very beginning of this address thank you so much sir sir i would like to ask you your views on what does better cities for pets uh, at home and pets on the streets mean what are the challenges you are facing and what is the kind of work that the kmc has been doing on the ground to make this a beautiful city for pets so please okay uh, so are you there on queue i think the internet has acted up probably that's the magnitude of the work that the kmc is doing which the internet also agrees with at this point uh, ma'am uh, neela tatu till dr utpal joins us would you like to give us your point of view on better cities for pets and the kind of work you've been doing on ground uh, ma'am you're on mute if you could unmute yourself welcome ma'am uh ma'am you are not audible yet uh in the meantime dr utpal has joined us uh, can we quickly bring in dr utpal dr utpal you are on mute as well if you could unmute yourself uh, that will be great okay uh, hi sir we can hear you uh ha 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 to do animal welfare shelter or pound is essential actually shelter or pound is the place where stray animals are impounded until they are claimed by their owners but our dhapa dog pound is something different in concept we are uh, keeping dogs there mainly for abc air we program primarily and secondarily for trauma cases rabies cases distemper parvo and also canine transmissible venereal sarcoma cases for chemotherapeutic treatment and uh, this was just told by our executive health officer dr mojumdar and james also selected a place at bhatchala where a multi storied large dog pound will be built up with better veterinary facilities uh, generally stray and community dogs are captured from the pre specified locality by the expert dog catchers with lasso or loop stick and transported them through dog catching vans sheltered in dog pound for neutering we have 273 kennels in dhapa and 33 kennels in entally dog pound uh, after resting for few days and deworming dogs are operated by our expert veterinary surgeons under dissociative anesthesia and subsequently the dogs are released in their own territory from where they were caught after post operative follow up a routine and routine anti rabies vaccination now one government sponsored abc rv program is going on and we are covering three wards of each borough kolkata has uh, 144 wards and 16 boroughs and we are covering three wards of each borough for abc air we program since 4 july and our target is vaccination of 88000 stray dogs the figure is given by ard department uh, through their survey they are telling that 88000 stray dogs are in kolkata and during this program 
fifty percent they are assuming male. Forty-four thousand gestation of male rocks will be done. And I heard one term in the seminar: end pet homeless index. To me, uh, to increase this EPH index, adoption of stray dogs are up. Are at most essential by the popular people of this society. My appeal is rather than keeping a pedigree dog, adopt one in this great mongrel, give home to the homeless by adopting mongrels. Only adoption of mongrel dogs by the celebrities change the attitudes of common people. It will give. A vibrant message to the common people, keeping pedigree dog. They will change gradually their attitude, keeping mongrel, which will be a symbol of high social standard later on. Again, the knowledge attitude practice KAP. Is coming. Uh, KP regarding KP has uh, already been mentioned by my teacher, Professor Chanchal Guha. Right, sir. With this, uh, with these words, I want to conclude and wish the event all success. Thank you, sir. Dono bad, sir. Achke apni amader shathe ache nee khane dani ache na amader paashe. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Madam Neela Tattoo, like to bring you in the same question. The kind of work you've been doing on the ground, the challenges you face. How do you think we can make a better world for pets, better city for pets? Uh, Ma'am, uh, we can't hear you. Uh, you're on mute. If you could kindly unmute, it'll be great. Okay, seems like we are facing certain technical challenges. Um, you can maybe try muting and unmuting once. Um, can you try unmuting once? Okay, ma'am, we still can't hear you, but uh, I think if possible, we'll just come back to you later if you manage to sort out that problem. Else, uh, we can look forward to a text also from you that we can read out, right, ma'am? I mean, I hope not. I hope to hear you, but uh, yes, welcome. Uh, so I'll just uh, quickly move to uh, Mr. Raman sir here. Sir, the Mars EPH index states that 40% of pets have been abandoned post COVID, right? There's been a lot of abandonment. Again, abandoning pets is one of the criminal problems today, so to say, if I can use that word. Sorry, ma'am. Uh, legally, we can't use that word. But again, it, it is criminal, right? Abandoning a pet. This also causes a worse city for pets, so to say. What do you think, sir? How can we supersede these challenges of abandonment? Is pet registration one of uh, the solutions to this? No, pet registration we are already doing. The main problem is the... Uh, all over India, we have a concept. Somebody wants to buy a dog or adopt a dog. He doesn't think over before buying or adopting. He wants the dog today itself for his daughter's birthday or somebody's. He wants to buy. He goes to any shop, buys it. And another biggest problem is before even adopting or buying, some of them doesn't know the breed also. They go to the shop, they say, I want a golden retriever. That fellow gives him some crossbreed. Right. He buys and takes it at home after two months. Then he starts ringing up, I want to get it registered. When And we have two systems. One is when the puppies is born, the owners are registered. The other one, the, if you buy a dog, if it doesn't have a paper, we register after only one year. And there are relatives all over India who are authorized to sign this and get it registered. That's not a problem. Registration is another thing. But biggest thing is nobody wants to learn before even buying. You see, when they come to us, then I suggest to them. You see, my job is different in NGOs, dogs are different. During NGOs, also, also most of the time something is there. I ring up her 
people give the number. She has taken and maintaining 500 dogs is not a matter of joke. And being after pandemic, pandemic before that, you know, most of them so difficult to get the money for. And during the pandemic, I remember I got quite a lot of testing from pay degree, getting giving. We had a little cooking system in my garage. From there, we used to feed the local. Coming back to the point is, you see, if the owners at least understand before, what is the flat I have, what is the A, he goes and have a big dog. And what happened? Five, six months, he finds he can't manage it. If they come to us, go to an NGO, at least we can put somewhere. They don't do that. I remember uh, about four, five years back in uh, near East Bengal ground, one Dumar was tied up and went. And we got the news after two, three hours. I picked up because being a man, I kept it in my house, gave it to some. So the best thing is we don't understand what we want. Right. And education comes afterwards. And everybody decides on the spot he wants to buy a dog. Right. He goes to a shop. I don't blame the shop. He's not a breeder. He wants, he is, it's his job, he gives you a dog. But And other thing is we have so many things. Any problem comes, we go to Google, we go to this, we go to that. But before buying that, nobody sees what is it. Right. So this is the biggest problem we face now. And when they come to us from the club, I have explained to them, but it is not everybody comes to. Probably 5% of the total people come to. Right. And what they say, you see, they buy via middleman. That man makes some money, the breeder doesn't get some money also. So it right. is the biggest, they think we may land, they lack the basic knowledge of buying. I want to adopt a dog, I don't buy what is my house, what is. I want a big dog, I buy it. After six months, you face a problem. This is what the scenario is. Right, right. We even see huskies who are not, you know, suited to this climate being there in societies and houses, right? Very good point, sir. Uh, and I think what I'm hearing from you is registration is not really a solution. Probably one of the solutions, but awareness, education, knowledge. We cannot just go impulse buy, right? The way we pick up chocolates from the store, we can't pick up puppies uh, from the breeders. Madam Tattoo, I think uh, you're glowing there. Okay. We can hear you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, finally we have you with us. Welcome. Thank you so much, Samek. So th thank you all of you for sharing whatever you have shared today. It's really mind-boggling the amount of work that is being done in this area, the number of people who are working with all their heart and soul towards these things. And thank you, Mars, for uh, you know um, inviting me to speak on you know such a big platform. We are only doing very small work over here. Uh, we work with the One Health concept. So uh, we've adopted um, uh, through a gram panchayat, you know, six villages on the outskirts of Bangalore. Uh, better cities for better pets is what we are talking about. But, uh, you know, cities are encroaching uh, the areas, the villages around it. And then that's the concept that we are working on. We are starting uh, to work with these uh, places with problems that cities are now pushing into their boundaries um, before they become a menace. So before the problem becomes a menace, just uh, stop it. Uh, before it begins and uh, you know work with uh, all the animals but especially dogs <clears throat> uh, so we don't call them strays of course we call them street dogs and street dogs uh, by, through adoption drives trying to make them uh, adopted family dogs rather than street dogs uh, we work with um, ABC uh, disease surveillance and disease diagnosis uh, we work with uh, nutrition and we are uh, encouraging adoption we also work with uh, school children to spread awareness about um, about this uh, you know, approach that we need to take to look after the dogs um, in the villages and uh, adopt them or at least not, you know, treat them like 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 something that they are not desired by looking after them and, um, you know, making them a part of the society, a healthy society over there. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Ms. Neela Tato. Finally, it's great to have you with us. Uh, I'll move to uh, Mr. Ajay Daga here. Thank you, sir, for joining us. I think we've discussed a lot about shelters and NGOs. Uh, would you like to highlight some of the key challenges that you face the, uh, with the work that you're doing on the ground? And uh, another question would be, how can we build a foster network for you and a network of community caregivers and rescuers who can support shelters and NGOs? First of all, sorry, we are very categorical about what we are doing and we don't go in for the rescue of pedigree dogs, which I would like to mention is mostly done in Calcutta by Sarda of Chaya and we stay away from that ground because what we, we cannot be rescuing stray dogs as 
well as pedigree dogs. So we have restricted ourselves to the rescue of just the stray dogs, and we are managing around 450 to 500 rescues per month. And out of that, the max we go is 150 sterilizations, and the rest is that those the hit and run cases and the cancer cases and all that stuff. And we're just trying to replicate the great lady out there is doing, Sarda. And pedigree dogs, they need something. But the chipping part that he said, it's just, I don't think it's possible because everyone out here is out to make quick money. Kutta chahiye, uske paas jao, number lega. So chipping ka baad mein hoga, you will get that thing later. And then after a few months, they take it in as a puppy. That puppy grows up after some time. Then they realize that there is shedding also. Puppy may turn to be a biter because they don't know what they are taking in. Whether they are taking in a Rottweiler or a pit bull. Huh? And the, the thing that, like, there is this thing that the pit bulls, oh, the rescued Rottweilers and all, they are very dangerous. We don't go for the rescue of these pedigree dogs. But at the moment, we have a rescued Rottweiler who was termed as a vicious biter and he was languishing. He, along with the Doberman, was languishing at CSPCA. And everyone was afraid that these two are biters because they had bitten one or two police personnel when they had gone in for the rescue. And at the moment, if Mopia can show you the video of that Rottweiler. You have met I, I had the good fortune of meeting the Rottweiler at Ashari. And I think, he's, he's, he's and I think Mopia can just put her face inside his mouth and he he'll won't, do nothing. he'll do nothing. It's how you handle the dogs. And we are just doing our bit by going in. And we, what we do is we go in for area-wise sterilization where we identify a local guy who will just identify the females and he knows the counts as to how many he or she knows the count as to how many are there. At the moment, our van is in Lilua. And there, there's this guy called Sailesh Upadhyay. He is coordinating, going lane to lane and picking up females. And as someone mentioned out there, that when we pick up an area, we make it a point that we complete nearly 90% or more in that area. So at the moment, we are targeting Khidirpur area, Delua, then this. Shobabajar area and Nimtala Ghat area. So... And as regards the abandonment, abandonment of the pedigree dogs, that's a vicious cycle. I don't know how we can go about that. Uh, sure, ma'am, please. Kennel club shows. Uh, do you all allow shows of, you know, 10 Bernards and Huskies and Rottweilers and other dogs over there? You do. But these, registered. yeah, registered, of course, but these dogs are not fit to live in a climate, Indian climate. So we pick up so many pedigree dogs, you know. I have had Huskies and St. Bernard and Rottweilers at Chaya been just picked off the street. Okay, so <coughs> why can't they be regulated breeding or, you know, you kind of tell the government there is a, there should be a policy change that such breed should not be allowed in India. Can't we do that? We have Indian breeds, so many different kinds of breeds. Why don't we just kind of allow that? It is because of the wrong selection of dogs. You see, when I go and buy a dog, I don't know what this dog is going to be. Somebody says, you buy a Rottweiler, I go and buy a Rottweiler. And after that, he, you know, what we come to us, we have a regular quite a lot of programs where we teach about the human and the dog, how you should behave, all those, we do it. But the problem is they come to us once the dog has become eight months, nine months, he has become already a biter. But in the show dogs which comes, you will find in the show most of the dogs are properly trained or whatever. Some of them also is there. And another thing is, most of the people buy dog for breeding. And what they do, they don't uh, tally the bloodlines between the ears. Normally, if the system is, if he's an aggressive dog, we say don't breed with him. But they don't, because most of them are, uh, they buy a dog, just keep somewhere in the village something, and then they immediately breed. And like what he said, once it becomes a biter, some of them leave on the street and go. 
or give it to somebody else and go and in we our system we don't put the dog to sleep so he becomes a monster and he goes on here and there but comparing to last earlier so many years back the rottweiler had a very bad blood lines and most of the all over the world it was put to sleep here only very few of them are there which are biters otherwise most of the rottweilers i have seen is all but yes there are some rottweilers which are biters dobermans which are biters Ma'am, ma'am, what we'll do? So, sorry, sorry, ma'am. Uh, my sincere apologies. What we'll do is we'll have a quick Q and A session. We'll first wrap up. No problem, ma'am. We'll wrap wrap this up with two more questions. Uh, Dr. Chini Krishna, I'd like to bring you in on uh, the aspect of better cities for pets at home. Sir, are you there with us? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, of course, a better city for pets entails pet-friendly businesses, pet-friendly offices, pet-friendly parks, commute, public transport, flights, aircraft, so on and so forth. but of course it also entails a lot of human animal conflict existing in rwas today for example in societies today how can we a make uh, advocate more pet friendly spaces which can be offices and how can we be in societies slightly mitigate this challenge through you know advocacy or through certain bodies or through regulations being put up i'll give you an example Uh, of the gindi industrial estate it's the oldest industrial estate in the country started in 1956 when venkat raman was the industry secretary industries minister uh in over the last 48 years that i have been here it has moved from a place which was totally animal unfriendly to a to a place where most dogs are welcome into most offices and these include the the it buildings the newer it buildings that have come up only because they see a notch here they see a dog without any mange you know there somebody spoke about the health benefits of spain one of the health benefits of spain is that the the incidence of mange goes down as all the veterinarians here can testify mange is an autoimmune disease and the time and it is exacerbated by stress the time that the animal is under the maximum stress is in the mating season when dogs and uh, males and females are competing for each other you still you spay the animal and you have you get rid of a lot of mange you still find mange but it is certainly very much less and once they know the animal has been sterilized and vaccinated and it's it's safe you will be surprised at how people's attitude change in this connection may i request dr murli that to please send me the photographs or the video he had of the hyderabad dog park because chennai city has now moved and the smart city has moved into a program called ccap that's care for animals uh care for pets care and uh, this would certainly help because one of the plans is to set up three dog parks right away in the city thank you sir and uh, of course dr mulidhar will share them with you sir final closing question to you uh on the streets while driving by we see a lot of sometimes injured dogs sometimes emaciated dogs uh we want to help them but we don't know how whom to reach out to whom to talk to where do we get medical care uh, or healthcare facilities for them how to get them sterilized when we try and go feed them as ma'am said we are called insane and uh, crazy right but how can the common man today common man willing to make a difference how can he or she uh, you know work for the betterment of these companion animals on the streets so your point of view you're asking me yes sir the closing okay. question for you sir okay. to, <laughs> to be to be a true animal person one must be a, a, a true people person also and one of the major uh, point, points of conflict is because animal people do not get along with a lot of human beings you talk to them nicely to people you'll be surprised at the kind of response you get and that has been proved i mean uh, we have a very very pet friendly commissioner of police in madras we have a very friendly managing director of the smart city we have a super friendly uh, dg director general of police all this has come about over the years because the animal welfare people here learned 
to talk politely to officers and other people. It's 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 quite simple, really. And uh, it Madras is well on the way to becoming the most uh, dog friendly, at least dog friendly place that you can think of. There are still pockets. I'm not saying no. Where uh, uh, rest of welfare associations are ill-treating animals and things like this, but the numbers have, have certainly come down in the past few years. Thank you so much, sir. And I think with that, we come to the end of this panel discussion. What a wonderful discussion we've had uh, across both the panels. I would like to thank Dr. Akanksha for beautifully moderating the previous panel as well. And uh, I think like Dr. Chini Krishna said, it's really easy. Just be nice to people, talking nicely amongst people in societies, on the streets, uh, in conflict as well, managing it in harmony through communication. You can do wonders just with that. Sir, I remember you mentioned the same point in Chennai as well. And uh, given that I think we are all nice people, dog loving, animal loving people here, the entire community has come together. It's really heartening to see. Thank you very much to everyone present here. And like I said, back in Chennai as well, uh, the road to ending pet homelessness or the road to a better city for pets and companion animals is long, dark, very deep, very difficult. But we have miles to go before we sleep. And together, as a community, we can do this and we will do this. Kolkata, Kodbo, Lodbo, Jeetbo. Thank you. Over to Vasudha. Thank you, Samik. I think uh, you said that, you know, the, the road is long, dark and deep. But I think it really starts from the heart. Okay. Absolutely. So I think that's what, that's what the key is. Thank you, everybody, for a fantastic and a very invigorating discussion. I'll just take another five minutes of your time. So I would, uh, I know I'm standing between everybody and lunch, uh, but I just wanted to kind of uh, summarize the discussions for today. Uh, so uh, so Dr. Chini Krishna, uh, he opened, our guest of honor, he opened the uh, the. The, the the proceedings by saying that a street is no place for pets and I will and uh, he said that ABC programs can really help. Uh, I will also add his uh, closing remarks saying how can the common man when Samik asked him how the how the common man can make a difference. He said to be an animal person we have to be a people person also. So I think it all starts with us. And I think this gathering is a beautiful gathering. We can make a lot of difference. Talk to each other, create those partnerships. Um, I think that's that's very important. Dr. Chanchal Guha said, knowledge, attitude, and practices are important to make a difference. We can improve awareness of the people and then change the lives of the animals. That's a very important point. Dr. Natasha Dogar anim said that animal welfare in all aspects of nutrition is all aspects of nutrition, healthcare, and scientific advancement. BIS is playing its part by creating standards for animals. Human food is not suitable for pets. Therefore, standards are cru uh, crucial to health of pets as they ensure quality of food and therefore pet nutrition. Dr. Mazumdar said we have a good that we have good support by KMC to ensure dogs' health or pets' health and can uh, that that they ensure dogs' health so that they can move around in localities. They take care and isolate rabbit dogs. They do ABC and ARV programs extensively. KMC does that. Uh, Mr. Kingshuk Pramanik uh, said animals have no judiciary to have justice. Therefore, justice is constantly denied. Cruelty to animals is rampant and we are failing from a human perspective. Again, it comes back to the same point. We have to start from our own hearts. One, we have to swing into action and social participation is very important. Dr. Cecilia said nutrition is key to good health of pets. Diet and nutrition can create disease but also help manage diseases. Veterinary professionals are key to health of pets. Therefore, it is imperative that there is uh, there is education which is built into the veterinary curriculum. Uh, Dr. Aprajita said it's great to see how good food is now available in India for pets and, and also for specifically for veterinary health. As an eminent veterinarian, she has proactively done her bit for pets with great compassion and great love. Uh, Ms. Sharda Radhakrishnan said dogs and cats uh, make our lives better and are therapeutic for humans. Pets on the streets can't get holistic diet as animal feeders and NGOs cannot afford to give manufactured pet food. And I think that's where, again, uh, you know, we need to start working together. 
Ms. Sushmita Lairi said uh, that we bring compassion to animals. Her being compassionate to animals made her made her found the NGO Voice for Animals in Kolkata. Every home should adopt one or two pets inside or outside the house and provide them with health care and good and food. Uh, Dr. Tatu said that nutrition is key for one health as healthy pets on and off the streets will only add to environment and human health. However, the problem is too large and we should do as much as possible, as much as possible to do it together. Uh, uh, for, on the BCFP panel, I think one of the things that came out uh, very clearly is that population control is key to better cities for pets and also education and awareness. I think that's very important. Uh, Mr. Arijit Mukherjee said that ABC is the best way to control street animal population. Administration and police need to support and control cruelty to animals. It has to be done by we, not I. Uh, Ms. Basak said complaints definitely come to them, but not about cruelty to animals, but about people feeding animals. Laws are very weak, but action can only be taken against the hit and run. One has to be compassionate and aware, and public education and awareness is the key. Uh, penal sections need to be strengthened for police to take action. All her pets have been rescued, and they are with her because they like to be with her. Uh, Mr. Raha said, we can't put a gun on anyone's head that you have to keep a pet. Many dogs are adopted and abandoned, so there should be a way to track these adoptions to keep the families responsible for their pets. Uh, Dr. Murlidhar said, during COVID, adoptions doubled, but many people abandoned dogs and rumors of animals spreading COVID. This problem cannot be mitigated easily. We also need more shelters and NGOs should be supported and funded with training and resources. Um, he said that dog parks and pet-friendly spaces are key to better cities for pets. Uh, Ms. Rubina said that ABC needs to be coupled with adoptions to ensure not just population control, but also their welfare. ABCs need to target 70%, uh, 70%, right? 70% of population to ensure sufficient reduction in population. Small isolated efforts do not make noticeable impact. Uh, Ms. Neela Tatu said it is mind-boggling how much work people are doing here, and I absolutely agree with her. Uh, they have adopted six villages around Bangalore. He's, she said that cities are encroaching villages, should, so they want to stop this from turning into a menace. They work with nutrition, disease awareness, and prevention, and also sensitizing kids as as to how they can make a better, better place for pets. Dr. Utpal Das said, Shel shelters and pounds are important. KMC pounds are providing ABC and healthcare facilities to street uh, street pets. More facilities are coming up with KMC. He appealed more people to adopt indie breeds. Uh, Mr. Raman said people don't think about adopting pets before they adopt. Breeders fool them with cross breeds. People should be educated before they adopt. I think that's a very very key point uh, for you know creating the responsible pet pairing parenting. People should be people should be aware and educated that it is almost like parenting. It's not like a toy that you pick up and then you throw back on the streets. After adoption, when they realize that it is not suitable, they abandon them instead of going to experts. Uh, Mr. Ajay Daga said, we do not go for rescue of breed dogs, but they have res they have restricted them, you know, the NGO to rescue. Uh, sorry, they don't rescue breed dogs. They only rescue street dogs. All breeders and middlemen are there to make quick money. People adopt without education and information, abandon. And therefore, you know, these abandoned dogs can become really dangerous till you can handle them properly. They pick up and complete 90% of sterilizations and vaccinations in their facilities. So um, that's to sum up uh, what is being uh, discussed today. I think health and nutri nutrition, uh, population control, and overall education and awareness is very critical uh, in this area, all of us coming together. And um, if anybody has any questions for the panelists, uh, we would like to welcome it before we close. Yes, any questions from the audience for the panelists? Good afternoon. Uh, my question would be for in, anybody to answer. I'm from media. I'm from Times of Bengal. 
uh, what we saw very recently uh, during the COVID and post-COVID that uh, people are uh, adopting uh, stray dogs, as you say, stray dogs or stray dogs, uh, because of uh, because they find them uh, people those who are influential in the society they are adapting them. And uh, my question would be like if I uh, adopt a dog or if anybody adopts a dog from the street or uh, maybe if you can pick up some dog from from the stray. Now, uh, how can we just means when we bring them home, then what would be the first thing what one should do? I mean, where, where they should go to protect or to give them care? That's a very, very relevant question. You, in order to keep a pet animal, the first thing you do is to go to a vet. And the vet should be nearby your place where you stay. Because there is no point going to a distant vet and when there's an emergency, you cannot reach them or the doctor cannot reach you. This is this, is, this first thing you do. Uh, before that, I would request you to make up your mind because the dog is not going to knock your door. You are bringing the pet into your house. So once you have taken it, it becomes your moral responsibility to stay with the dog and planning the welfare of the dog, its housing, its nutrition, good health. For the next 14 or 15 years, or whatever the lifespan of the dog is. So whether I do that, then take the pet, bring it home, find a vet, take the consultation and keep the dog. Just as simple as that. I hope it clears your. Do we have any further questions from the audience? Yeah, I can see one hand there. Good afternoon. I'm Alok Kumar, a member from the Voice for Animals. I just want to say one thing. We need to bring compassion to animals, uh, people's compassion for animals. When we were kids, we used to see in the locality various animals like cows, buffaloes, not only dogs and cats, goats and other things. The government has made stringent rules that cows and buffaloes are not allowed to stay in the city. Why? We should allow them. Let them be. The children don't know these animals. If in some day may come, if they want to see a cow, they may have to go to the zoo. They're not there. So if, if these cows, buffaloes grow with us, they they can bring compassion, love, and affection. Some care may be required from uh, for hygienic purpose. Government can make regulations, but some cities like Haridwar and some they have allowed cows and others everywhere. So we can control this. I think government should make this free that not restrict animals in these zones. Only they should be allowed in every place. That is one thing. And then I have been told that some pet shops are selling pets which are infected, pets having diseases to the people. People can't understand that and they are buying them after a few days, the pets are dying. So how to check that and what remedy can be that? This is a question I have. Thank you. When are the puppies, they are more prone for the diseases like a Viral diseases, poroviral, you can call it as a COVID in the puppies, in a similar way. There's no remedy for it, there's no cure for it. Only thing is we can manage the situation. And before anything happens to them, we, uh, the puppy to be brought to the, the whoever is selling the puppies, please, we need to educate the people, don't buy the puppies, at least minimum, they should be two months of age. At least they, sh they should uh, take the milk of the mother, colostrum, into the fullest, then they develop the immunity. Then the puppies are the more disease resistance. This we need to educate the people who are buying the pet. And the breeder is always, breeder, seller is always in greed 
he wants to get rid of the puppy the moment that that is, is the money for him he is not a living being the puppy means is saleable it's also for money for him he is not living being so definitely wants get rid of that as a whatever he is, he tell some stories and give them but the, we need to educate the owners not to buy the puppy before 2 months at least by the time they uh, resume and they gain the immunity self immunity even then uh, first the as i told the moment you get take a puppy go to a vet and show them and uh, once you tra- trust that the puppy is going to be all right then it'll go the buy thank you many people come and complain to me that they have brought puppies from pet shops uh, a few days after they find that the puppy is sick with some disease and they die also so how to stop this pet shops from selling this kind of puppies already the animal welfare board of india there is a rules are there ma'am definitely uh, they can close that if at all that not being maintained as per the standards of the SOP AWA breeders uh, regulations are there. If there is any pet shop is not maintaining the rules and the facility for the puppies are not met with the recommendations, then the shop can be closed. That can be seized. The local animal welfare board of India, uh, local uh, state animal welfare board of India can take the action on that. Otherwise, anyone can give a complaint to the police station. They are showing these rules and they will close it. We are done in Hyderabad. Yes. Okay. Where can we get go and complain? against this shop anyone can do even police station can go ma'am i'm sorry but can we have an offline discussion if that's not a problem because i think uh, we're getting a bit oh. uh, late okay. i'm sorry about that okay. okay so i think we should end by a big round of applause for the discussions and the panelists and everybody here uh, Masuda, uh, dr madhubita has a very quick idea to share with us ma'am okay uh, thank you for uh, beautiful workshop seminar I'm just uh, g- giving one idea. That is, uh, maybe we can think about some uh, kind of ad from the state government. You can recommend from your desk to the, all the other state government also. That uh, like uh, Roj Khao Ande, you can uh, government can think about some kind of ad for uh, this kind of adoption, street dog adoption. So that will work. I sure, think. sure, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great idea. I mean, we've tried to implement it at a smaller level, and we'll also be taking it forward uh, in the future. So, so thank you very much. I would once again like to thank our guest of honors, Dr. Chini Krishna, uh, Dr. Chanchal Guha, um, Dr. Nitasha Dogar, Dr. Tapapriya Majumdar, Dr. Cecilia Vilavarde, and our chief guest, Dr. Uh, Kingshuk Pramanik. I would also like to thank uh, my colleague, Dr. Mr. Nitin Jain, uh, for. Uh, Uh, for being there with us and thank you all the panelists and all the delegates and all the media i think we've had a fantastic discussion and we would like to continue this conversation in kolkata so please let's all be in touch and uh, take this forward thank you very much i invite you all to join us for lunch <laughs>